Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face episode 90. Episode 90, can you believe we've done 90 episodes of this show? One more episode and we get to grunge music. <laughs> Good point. Folks, E3 is so close, we can taste it. We're definitely going to talk about it today, but we're also going to talk about Nintendo just announcing how the online services for Switch are going to work. Such as it is. Yeah. Uh, and we're also going to talk about the latest VR sensation, if you can call anything VR sensation, Star Trek Bridge Crew. And we're going to do our first round of E3 publisher previews. Can you feel the hype? I can feel it. Let's go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another exciting edition of Game Face E3. Just about a little over a week away, kind of yeah. ish. The way they're it's starting like, E3 now, it's like like everybody will start arriving. Yeah, about a week from now, I think EA's thing starts on the that Saturday. What, yeah, what tomorrow. There's Saturday, <coughs> Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yep. E3 just keeps getting longer. Uh, I saw today that they're starting to put up the big billboard on the fig. Yep. A uh, God of War is the mural this year. Is it? Yeah. I thought it was Battlefront 2. No, it's God of... I saw God a picture of, of Battlefront 2. It's God of War, uh, which means probably big things for that game hmm. uh, at the show. Um, we're not going to talk about Sony this week. We'll be talking next week. We're going to start our run of publisher previews. Uh, we're going to do three in this episode, and then we'll bang out the rest next week. Um, but we do have a few smaller topics we want to get to before we start talking about E3. And the first of those is Star Trek Bridge Crew. Uh... Your game of E3 from last year. Yep. And it's in our hands. Sort of. It's on our heads. In, our, on, in your <laughs> face. Yep. It's, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a VR game for PlayStation VR, Vive, and Oculus. Yep. All of them, and they all have cross-play with each other. Oh, I didn't even realize yeah. that. Um, so Which is good, because you, you got to expand that player base. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Especially for VR. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's basically a first-person simulation of flying a ship. And there are five roles, four roles, four roles, four roles. There's there's captain, helm, tactical, and engineer. Yeah, and uh, each role has very specific objectives and things that they have to accomplish. Mm. Um, what is your favorite role that you've played so far, Matt? Um, I think my favorite is probably engineer. Okay. Right now, uh, just because like. It's a less, uh, like, moment-to-moment -moment hands-on role, like, in general, but you kind of make everything run. And so you have to decide how much power gets routed to each system, uh, engines and shields and phasers. And then you also are in charge of repairing stuff, and you're also in charge of routing power to warp and impulse engines. So basically, no, no one else can do anything if you're not on the ball, but you aren't actually doing anything directly to the ship. And then there's also, like, if you're in more advanced things, you can... If you, you know, like in emergencies, you can switch to routing power, and you can like reroute power from one system to the other, and like supercharge a system you really need right now. But if you do that too long, you'll damage the ship, which you then have to repair, and that takes. Yeah. So it's kind of a you're kind of balancing like the the resources the ship has as, as it's at its disposal, trying to kind of figure out the best like arrangement for it in the current situation and what everybody else who's playing needs at the time. And it's a really fun kind of constant juggling act. And people forget you're there. Okay? Yeah. Because, you know, if, the you're if you're good, they forget. If you're good, they forget. You know, if your captain's <laughs> sitting there yelling, like, orders of where, you know, where to go for the helm and which thing to shoot at for tactical. And meanwhile, engineering's just, like, making you all... It's very Scotty. It's yeah, in, it is, in the yeah. sense that it's like, <laughs> it's like, none of you would be able to get anything done if I wasn't totally on the ball. But, you know, it's a... Um, so that's probably the most fun. I played Helm at E3, and that was cool too, steering the ship around and you know, you know. Going, I think that's the easiest role of them all. It's the most straightforward. I think it's, it's the most traditional video yeah. game ish role because you played that probably the most. Yeah, and um, it makes sense yeah. the way you're doing it. Yeah, it's intuitive. Uh, yeah, tactical is. Um, that's my favorite. Tactical's fun. Tactical's fun because it like it's it's not focused on any one thing. It's like kind of it's kind of every other job in a ship just sort of pushed to this one seat. Yeah. So tactical has to raise and lower the shields. Tactical has to um, uh, uh, basically scan everything. Scanning is a big deal in Star Trek. Everything has to get scanned because then yeah. you know everything it, it, what, what's going on. You have to uh, you, you activate photon torpedoes. You can fire them. You can fire phasers. You have to lock on to everything. 
and before you fire phasers, uh, and, and so you're in charge of the weaponry. You're also in charge of infiltrating enemy systems, which yep. can shut down various you know, weapons or engines or... or yeah, because um, you scan the ship. Yeah, you scan it, and then you can have access to... Uh, specific parts of it. Taking out specific parts with, like, basically it's hacking. Yeah, you have or, the shield, the hull, and the weapons that uh, you can target specifically. Those are first... You can specifically target phasers to those. With phasers, you can phasers. target those three. Yeah. yeah, and then you have system infiltration, which is... Um, it lets you shut down... Uh, various th- so you can shut down comms or shields or like briefly it's like it's like a like a debuff basically yeah. um it's like hacking and then also you use it against like like if you find like an abandoned ship you can use like comms infiltration to like read their logs and figure out what happened to them or whatever and yeah. then you're also in charge uh at least in the uh the aegis which is the default kind of abrams did jj abrams versus ship uh you're also in charge of transporting um, which is uh, a very risky proposition, yeah. mostly because you have to have your shields down, you have to wait for everything to lock on, and da da da. So, and then the captain, uh, the captain is kind of the more social one. Like if you're in a multiplayer game, you're going to be talking, every, you're going to be barking orders. Yeah, um, it's the, a big role. It is, and so the captain <laughs> has access. I'm intimidated when I play captain. It's, I mean, luckily I played enough single player that kind of knew how it worked. Uh, and then, but like captain, you have to like um, you choose where you're going. You tell everybody what to do. You have kind of an overall status you can look at. You 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 take inhales. You have a button that goes to red alert, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so like you're kind of overseeing everything. Like no one else in the game has such a complete overview of the ship as the captain. So yeah. like the other three are working blind in certain ways, and the, only the, a good captain can kind of make all three work together properly in a lot of ways. Like, like, you can react as best you can as the engineer, but if the captain sees something that, you know, you, you don't really have the the overarching awareness that you might need to, like, know that, okay, our next move is to go against this guy who's behind us and try to turn around, so we need to put more power to the engines to turn faster, and then right after that we need to throw everything into the phasers so we don't run out of juice, and, like... It's, uh, if you get a good captain, like, it's a totally different game. It really is. You're right. I only played two games with other people online. Mm-hmm. I went through the whole tutorial, played a game by myself, and then two online. Uh, the first one I played was a complete disaster <laughs> in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one thing I will say about this game is if you have one bad apple, you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. And I feel like, it, and for, second of all, it took me a long time to get a game because it'll match make you you with everybody else, and you'll get people that are AFK. <coughs> like, mm-hmm. I got one guy that was snoring. <laughs> and as soon as I joined, everyone else is like, dude's AFK, I hear... <laughs> and then I was like, oh, crap. And then it it took, like, three or four tries to actually get a game, and then my first <laughs> game, uh, the helm was terrible. And that's one thing I love about the game, but also one one thing about it that I think is a little bit of a detriment, is that you're so reliant on everybody else. Mm. It is a total symbiotic relationship. You're relying on every single person to do their job and do it well. And if they don't, it can be complete disaster. Mm. Um, but that's also what I love about it. Like, yeah, it's still pretty fun. They, when I played my second game, I played. I was the rookie in that game and played with a bunch of people who had been playing for a while. And oh my gosh, like it is like one of those moments where you're just like... Mm-hmm. Like when you see all the crew members working together, and then you, and it's like I was we were talking about with Friday the Thirteenth. Like you get people that role play. Mm-hmm. So we had a guy who was talking like Scotty, and another guy. You know, it, it's if you're a Star Trek fan, this is like Star Trek porn. I think. Oh yeah, it's really good. <laughs> and I, I will say, I'm not. By the way, like I'm I've not never really been I'm, into Star Trek. I know Star Trek. Like I'm aware of it. I've yeah. seen the shows. I've seen the movies. I'm not what you probably call a fan. Yeah. Like, like in the in terms of like you know, I don't own any you know ship models i can't quote more than about five things you know yeah. i like star trek for the best you know is that, yeah. like, is <laughs> me it, too <laughs> it's you know i'm not like what would be termed a trekkie or a trekker or, right or, but like but i know it and i appreciate it and i enjoy it and like i i love this game like top to bottom like it's like the inter it's the same kind of the same thing as like werewolves uh, that werewolf game yeah werewolves, uh, werewolves within where like you know, it just works as this kind of social co-op thing, and it gives you an experience you just haven't had before. For sure, yeah. Um, and, like, you know, there's been some criticism that it's a simple game, and it is. Like, what you're doing moment to moment at each station is pretty simple. I like the actual gameplay, and we should probably talk about how that works, too. Yeah. Um, I played with just a DualShock 4. I use the Move controllers. I just use the DualShock 4. It works great. The yeah, right thumbstick controls your right arm, the left thumbstick controls your left arm, and then the right trigger controls pushing a button with your right arm. The, the only, left trigger controls the left. The only problem I've seen is like some. I guess some people can tell 
if someone's using a DualShock, and there have been a couple... I, I was in a game where there was a platform argument. Why? Because it's cross-platform, and the people play, the guy playing uh, Captain was like an Oculus guy. Uh-huh. And he's like, oh, great, we got a PlayStation Who new cares? kid. We got a PlayStation kid on, on Helm or something. <laughs> oh, no. And there's, I was like, what? <laughs> there like, con- there's console shaming con- in this yeah, game? Yeah, yeah, there's console... <laughs> there's like platform wars in, in <laughs> Come on. among the crew. Oh, that's ridiculous. Um, but, like, it, you know, you're going to run into that. That you know, Oculus right? guy should be damn happy that PlayStation's on there, because if there wasn't, he would never get yeah, a game. Exactly. Yeah, he would not be able to play. <laughs> you should not be complaining. <laughs> exactly. Um, it does run through the Ubisoft club friend list, it unfortunately. Does, yeah. So, like, there have been a sudden, a sudden flurry. Cause it was a sudden flurry of friend re- requests there, I saw, because anyone who, was, who I knew, like, saw I was playing, it was like, Ubisoft club, Ubisoft club. I'm like, okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another service friends list to go through but like it works pretty well um you know and then you know with the motion controls you basically have direct control over your hands and you pull the trigger to you pull it a little bit and you point and you pull it all the way and you kind of make a press button fist is that a little dicey um it's not as good as on like uh like probably the vibe or the oculus touch yeah Um, it's a little and it's yeah i have a weird i have a thing on mine i don't know if this is just the playstation vr but it's just my system um the 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 character and the console on my constantly like vibrate back and forth. Oh really? Bit. Like they it, 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 it looks like I'm constantly kind of rocking. I haven't had that problem. And like, it, and like it's like you don't notice it when you're actually playing because the rest of the room doesn't do that. But the uh, the console seems to kind of not quite know where I am sometimes. Oh weird. Um, and I re- recalibrated the PSVR. I moved everything. I turned the lights up. The whole the whole deal. And it didn't didn't really solve anything. It's it's not a game killer, but like it was just weird that like I don't remember it doing that when I played it before and I've never seen it happen on anything else. Um but uh yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I I have to give special mention to uh the original Enterprise, which you can see right here. So there's the campaign, which is only a prologue and five missions. It's not very long. It's probably yeah. A that's one hours. of the major criticisms I've seen <laughs> in the game is that there's just not enough content there. Uh, not single player anyway. And then, uh, then you have the ongoing missions, which is um, basically procedurally generated missions that are kind of cobbled together through the various things you can do in the game. And in ongoing missions, you can choose either the USS Aegis, which is the, the default ship, which is from like the J.J. Abrams reboot verse. The, the campaign takes place after those movies. Like uh-huh. you're looking for a new home for Vulcans after the destruction of Vulcan in the original J.J. Uh, Abrams movie. And, um, or you can pick the original Enterprise, which is what you're seeing here. The original Enterprise is a completely different gameplay experience. They've modeled this That's thing cool. down to the, to the light. E- each individual light on this thing is accurate to the old 60s set. In, in fact, even the music goes lo-fi <laughs> when you switch to this. <laughs> and all great. the same sound effects. So instead of like kind of the fancy floating hologram touchscreen things you have on the Aegis, so all your controls become these unlabeled like candy buttons. Which is insane if um, you think about it. If you, when they were creating this show... yeah. That's what they thought the future was going to right. be. Right, these glowing buttons that mean, like, and, and like, <laughs> like, if you're the engineer, you can't see the engineer in this, but the engineer's to the left, facing away from the screen, pretty much. They have their own screen. Uh, and, like, it's just this flurry of red and orange and gold buttons. And, like, you have a, you have a helper thing that you can press the button that pops up and yeah. you can see that they're all, works all for any ship. Yeah. But you basically, like, you're, and, like, so you can see there, like, instead of uh, using the, um, like, a touchscreen, you have to pick up a clipboard and pick where you want to go, and you have to, like, you know, bring the, the warp map up on the main screen and, and, like, click through each star system until you get to it, and then confirm that, and then tell the helm, like, that's where it's you so want to go. how when they made that show, they could not even comprehend no. what the future was going to be like. And so it's a very, and, like, the screen is smaller, and, like, it's just a very different experience. And, like, it, the first time I, I loaded that up, I'm like, what the fuck does everything do? I guess, like, there's no way to know, like, what anything does. Um, the other weird thing I've had with this in terms of like VR snafus is um, the captain's chair, like most of his controls are on kind of the arms. Yeah. Uh, the arms tend to be lower than my couch. Oh. So the buttons I'm, tr- I'm trying to press are like under the cushion. <laughs> so I've had to kind of like do this thing where I sit up a little bit and recenter the camera and like it puts them high enough that I can press them. But now my, like, my character's head is sort of in its chest. I've had problems where I go to look down as a captain and I look down so far that it loses, oh, it loses sync yeah. and the whole screen just goes black yeah. when that happens. I've had that happen a couple of times. I have not tried, I didn't want to buy it twice so I haven't tried it on the Vive. Yeah. I bought it on PlayStation VR because I figured like that would I'm be I'm surprised to hear that actually. It's just easier to play because, um, like I said, I have some trouble with the 
survive on sit down games because uh -huh. I, my chair, my PC chair is so high back that the cord in the back gets very oh, wow. looks snarly. And I also don't have a great voice chat solution on That's my true. PC. I don't, I just don't really do that normally. Um, I might get it eventually. I'm curious to see what the, because it's like I've never played a game on both PlayStation VR and Vive and compared them directly. Right, yeah. It'd be interesting to me to see. Like you know, which one which one it looks better? Which because sometimes I find the PlayStation VR, even though the graphical fidelity is lower, looks better. It looks clearer because interesting. Um, like just the way the PlayStation the PlayStation VR just like seems easier to kind of get in focus in the center, and sometimes the vibe is very picky about that. Interesting. Um, so I don't know. It's, uh, it's I, I made my choice and I'm I'm okay with it. But uh, I, I there's there's moments where I miss the the accuracy of the vibes. Uh, motion tracking controllers. One thing sure. I will say on Shane's VR vomit scale, <laughs> this gets a one. I do not get sick playing this game oh, at man. all. I have no problems with it. Um, so if any of you guys are out there and you have the same issues I do with VR, this is one game you are 100% safe. Yeah, because you're just sort of sitting there. Yeah. So. And yeah, nothing <laughs> even moves, really. Yeah. You just see people with their arms like moving around mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's totally good as far as that's concerned. Um, what was the price? I got it. They sent me a code, so I don't know how much um, it costs. 50. 50? Ooh. 40 or 50? I think it was 50. It's 50 on Steam. I know that. That's too much. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. That's too much. Um, Unless you're a big fan. Yeah, I mean, if you're a Star Trek fan, don't like, even think twice. If you're a Star Trek fan, or <laughs> yeah, or if you just really want to see something cool done with VR. If you haven't used yeah. a VR headset in a while, and you're like, I want something to do with this. And now, of course, anyone who buys a Vive gets it free. No, that's it right. Comes that's with a new the deal that now. comes with Vive. That's a good idea. Which is, yeah, that's exactly the game you want to package with that. Yeah. Because it's, it gives you this little glimpse of, like, wow, what this could be. What it, it could if be, it, yeah. If it really, you know... It's primitive. It's like playing, you know, it's like playing probably Super Mario Brothers one compared to like what Super Mario Brothers three right. eventually yeah, became. Yeah. You know, in your head, you're yeah, thinking yeah. about what that could eventually become. But like, don't like, you it, find it funny? It's there. Don't it's you, something's there. Don't you find it funny that the best VR games are the least active VR games? Yeah, they're the ones that really focus on the social element of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an angle where, and I've talked about this before, where I think Facebook is probably going to take Oculus eventually as in this more social area. They've kind of shown glimpses of that already. Uh, but it, the, the games that I've enjoyed the most for VR are the games where I really don't do that much. It's all about mm -hmm. interacting with other people in the virtual world. Uh, and with this game, just like it was with their Werewolves Within, like every once in a while you just kind of get giddy. Like yeah. at least I do. You get that like feeling like welling up inside you like this is like the future. Like mm -hmm. this is something really cool that I haven't experienced before. Oh, now yeah. it's 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 like um, you know it's like it's like it's it's the taste of that that feeling you had when you saw the Matrix and yeah. when you removed it from kind of the dystopian horror right. of it <laughs> you're, you're, you're like wow that'd be really cool uh -huh. you know, it's like and this is kind of that thing and and that's why you know the shared hallucination aspect of it is really yeah. what sells it as a concept and it's you know I think that's going to be for most people more compelling than sort of like okay you're playing a shooter but you're it's in your head, you know, it's 3D. Yeah. Now you can hold the gun, you know, like Farpoint's cool and all in that regard, but this is like nothing I've ever played from a, you know, unless you've played Artemis. Yeah, I've never uh, heard which of that. Is, Artemis is a bridge simulator that's sim similar. Uh, you know, it's not Star Trek you know, licensed, but it's Star Trek, you know, it's clearly Star Trek. And it's like everybody needs their own laptop or tablet or whatever. It's been oh, around geez. for a long time. Um, basically, it's it's in the real world, and like you, you, there's a lot of hooking up that has to happen. But it's a similar idea. Gotcha. Uh, this is obviously you know a, it's not cheaper because you got to have a multi hundred dollar headset to pl to play it. But it is, uh, and also Artemis has no online play, so you have to have everybody in the Makes same room. Makes a big difference, yeah. Um, but this is like you know a similar concept. It's also if you if anyone's played um, Space Team, there's a mobile game, a free mobile game, I think. Space team, like you can hook up with like you know local kind of local play with other people on the, with a game on a smartphone, and basically it, it randomly generates a uh, like a console, like a, a spaceship console, and like you'll get orders that pop up, and sometimes the orders of what to do are not for something on your console, and you have to like announce do this, and then whoever has that control on their phone has to do it, and so everybody has to constantly run these these things until like. And it basically gets faster and faster until somebody screws up and it all comes unraveled. Um, but it's that kind of like, you know, forced co-op and everybody's got to be on the ball. And as soon as somebody kind of, you know, wobbles a bit, it all sort of starts to come apart. The I house guess. of cards. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really fun. I it's, think that's it's, my biggest it, issue really with this game is that 
it is a simple game as far as gameplay yeah. is concerned, but there's kind of a lot that you have to keep track of. You have a lot of responsibilities for each mm-hmm. role. Um, for instance, and, I, think, I don't think you're going to be an effective captain until you've played the other three roles. Oh, maybe a couple times, yeah. actually. And uh, I, I have not played it enough to know, but I feel like matchmaking for this game is going to be really important. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, one bad apple can spoil the whole barrel, and yeah. it can be really well, frustrating. Like, like ideally, you game, play with friends, I think. Yeah. And, like, my second game, I had somebody yell at me a couple times. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. They were like, yo! And I was like, I, this is my second game. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> I would do the tutorial, and I played two games. I'm fresh out of the account. Academy, man, come on. Yeah, but at the same time, I kind of like that too. I actually felt like I was doing a job, and this mm. guy was like my boss, yelling at me. It's really weird how it kind of affects you yeah. psychologically. Well, and also because you because it feels like you're there, and there's, there's yeah. sort of that. Con- you have a yeah. presence. You get into that kind of, and you could even even when I did the demo, and our uh, our engineering guy was having trouble understanding how like the like because you know, the engineer has to transfer the power to the warp coils before you can warp out. And we were trying to warp out before we got destroyed by like fourteen Klingon ships. Uh-huh. And the the captain was the guy demoing it for for Ubisoft, and like you could tell he was trying to hold himself back. I'm like transfer the warp power, go go. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, he's like just do that, do that. Okay, press the button, yeah. press that, and it's like you can you can tell it's like you know. You get into it and you, you, do, and yeah. you feel like you're you there. Play and role, yeah. Like every, you're just like it's like no, come on, engineering, get to get it together. It's like yeah, and uh, but that's part of the fun, especially like the first week. I think is part of the fun where everything goes crazy and everyone's like ah fuck yeah, and uh, you know there's, there's NPC crew members flying across the bridge as, as like stuff explodes and things. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's it's a lot of fun. I think one thing I would say is it's a little impersonal because you don't. It's like when you you're fighting other ships. It's like they're just these little blips on the screen, yeah. and like well, you can improve. Uh, you know, a, a good captain will use the magnify feature to let you see the ship on yeah. the main screen because because like the helm kind of sees his own thing to some degree. Like you can kind of navigate as you need to because the helm only needs to see like kind of the top down map and to see you know keep things in the phaser arc, whereas. Um, uh, you know, the, the, if you want to like kind of make it a little more cinematic, you can do that. You can also put up heading uh, information on the on the main screen. There's a lot of like options. Well, at least on the on the Aegis. I don't know about the classic <laughs> classic Enterprise. It might just be a guy with a marker like write, writing <laughs> writing the heading at the top of the screen. It's not. But I'm impressed by and like I love. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but like on the on the other one, the the Aegis uh, ship, there's a really nice reflection effect. On the, the main graphics screen, look good. you can see the back of the sh- like the back of the room you're in reflected kind of like yeah. Like you kind can of turn distorted. all the way around and you have a 360 view of the ship. One but, thing I will but say, but like the, the the screen is kind of like this kind of Apple Store glass. Thing. Yeah, you yeah. can see the back of the thing reflected in, in it. The in the screen. It's it's the sense of place is really convincing. Yeah, the uh, the graphics. Right, people are... do that all. The t- it's like everybody's just pointing up and down doing the, the the dance. Yeah, the graphics are pretty good. Like even the lighting I found was uh, was pretty good. Like the shadows are nice and smooth. They're not jaggy. Um, a couple of the ships are a little empty. It's like mm-hmm. you look around you and you're like, did they just have like this much free space in the ship? Just this empty like <laughs> expanse of nothing. Well, in they're the doing ships. the J.J. Abrams movies. Yeah, like a giant, right. they're like giant Apple stores. Yeah, <laughs> presumably um, there will be. I think there will probably be DLC coming. Uh, I would like to see them do more enterprises. Yeah. Essentially, yeah, it'd be fun to have them do the next generation mm-hmm. one, which is a little less 60s candy button and a little more like touch screeny. Yeah. Uh, the L cars yeah. system it would be fun to play with. Um, I'd love to see them do uh, actual characters, like have guest characters or something like on the, you know, like like Jordy or somebody is on the bridge for a special mission for like, right. you know, randomly like you can have that happen that'd be cool but that, like, that kind of goes back to what i said about being impersonal right and I, but i also think that you know this is just the beginning i feel like this game has the propensity to become something so much more mm-hmm. i mean you could have klingons boarding the ship and then the gate you actually get up out of your seat and like defend the ship like there's this is just kind of like the the base of what could come mm-hmm. and ultimately I don't know if it'll get there a lot of that will depend on how well, well you could definitely add a um like a security station who has to like direct um, like you know the, the security and marines or something. You know, send a, them to send like them the very, doors to, to stop like in. yeah, yeah. Infil- you know, infiltrations, incursions, or like put out fires and kind of deal with yeah. things like that. Like, there's there's room for expansion in about fifteen different ways in this game. So now for the big question, Matt. Now that you've played it, the final mm-hmm. version. Do you feel good about your pick for game of the show last year at E3? Yeah, you do. I think so. Like it's you know it's not going to be for everyone, especially because of the cost of getting into it. But yeah. in terms of like something that I've just like 
I came away like feeling like, wow, I've never played anything like this, yeah. at least not on that scale and that level. Like, I still feel that way when I play it. Yeah, I do too. Um, Am I going to tell you to run out and buy it in a headset? Mm, no, no, it's not the killer app. Not, I mean, unless you're a Star Trek fan or a spaceship fan that looks at this and is just like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Like, you go for it's it, going to live up to you. Yeah, like, go you know, for it's, it. It's yeah. probably going to live up to what you're hoping for. There are like, you know, Star Trek, super Star Trek bolt counting nerds are going to, you know, have like, like, like the hyperspace effect is wrong. Right. They um, could actually like, end up hating the game. There's little things that are different. <laughs> and, and again, this campaign is set in the Abrams verse. So if you're, if you hate the Abrams verse and I can't blame you, um, then, uh, yeah, you might get put off by the fact that it's not the Star Trek you love or Star Trek you want. I would like to see them sort of, you know, slowly expand it and add more. Because you can also play the campaign missions online. So I'd love to see them add more campaigns in different areas. You know, if you, if the DL, there's DLC for Next Generation, not don't just give me the ship. Give me, like, a few missions yeah, in the Next sure. Generation area. You know, like, do something like that. I, I think this could be, you know, again, for Ubi and Ubisoft is very on board with this, I think this could serve as a very good platform game you know, in terms of, like, for sure. selling game more content. Game is a service. That's yeah, what Ubisoft's yeah. all about now, according to Ubisoft. So Right, and this game would lend itself extremely well to that if they're willing to continue to support it. Yeah, I think the price tag is too high. I wasn't aware that it cost it that much. Um, I think $30 would probably be the sweet spot for this game. Yeah. So, I mean, if you get a physical copy through Amazon, if you're a Prime member, that's about what you'll pay. Yeah, so that's all that's right. That's true. Uh, and eventually, you know, I love I love the, the, the crew members flying over the rails. Yeah. <laughs> Why are there no, like, seat belts? Right. On the, or for that matter... Isn't that artificial gravity you got there? Right. Why is it doing anything? Why, why yeah. are we being affected at all? Yeah. Um, we get into that. But, yeah. like, it, <laughs> and it's, just, it's just like, it, to me, this is sort of like, you know, I love Bridge Commander, which was a similar game on PC about 13 years ago or so. Um, to me, it's like, uh, this is sort of like the equivalent of, like, X-Wing a little yeah. bit. It's, it's kind yeah, of, you know, a good analogy. Star Trek is a more deliberate and slower game, slower show. Yeah. Than, than Star Wars, but it's like it, you get that same feeling that X Wing and Tie Fighter gave you. Where like, wow, I'm really flying this thing that is from the universe that I've wanted to yeah. fly for forever. Yeah, yeah. and so it's uh, it's it's if you have the means, for sure. If you don't have a headset, this isn't really a reason to pick one up. But one day it might be. Right. One day, if you find if you something else, buy, yeah. you should pick this up for yeah. sure. And then by then, I think it'll be down in price to where yeah. like if we're you, comfortable with. Yeah. If you do buy a, a VR headset. Like, this should be a day one yep. purchase. And you don't have a choice if you buy a Vive. But yeah. Like, uh, which is wise. It could really make a difference for Vive as well. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's Even though it's only a $40, $50 bargain or whatever. I mean, give it time. If, like, you know, if they, you know, six, six, eight months from now, if they support it with DLC properly, it could be a really robust title. Yep. So I think we're both in agreement. Loving it. Star mm -hmm. Trek fans, buy it without hesitation. Everybody else, maybe wait yeah. for a price I drop. mean, really, if you have a VR headset... Buy it. Buy it, I yeah. would say. I mean, if you, especially if you Or want. maybe wait for it to go down a little bit. Yeah, like, I mean, based on your budget, one way or the other, like, it's, you're not going to be disappointed with it, I don't think. Yeah. I, the only thing I it would delivers, say... delivers, I guess. Is yeah, the, the only thing, thing I would say is, like, maybe err on the side of, like, buying it a little early because, you know, I don't know how long, you know, the, the online, online might dry lasts, up. The online lasts, yeah. You know, like, I would hope this has some legs on Werewolves it. Werewolves Within still has tons of people playing, true. so... And there's, there's a few bugs to be ironed out. There's a, there's a warp bug where, like, you can get stuck in warp forever. Yeah, um, which is just like just frustrating because everyone just has to quit out. Yeah, um, yeah. I had a couple. I don't know if they were crashes, but infinite loads mm -hmm. where it just went on forever and ever. And I had, a to, little bit. I, I had to go back out to the dashboard, close the app, start yeah. it back up. I've lost connection to the to the, ser the UV servers a couple times, but like that'll all get better. Overall, not. I mean, Werewolf said that has similar similar problems at the time, and they fixed those. So. I think it's interesting how you're seeing with VR people flocking to the good games like werewolves within and star trek but then you try to play something else and it's, oh yeah it's like nope. there's just not enough people to kind of fill out the ranks of those smaller less Im less impressive games mm -hmm. like i got a uh a game that's basically just racquetball like i just wanted to use it to work out essentially mm -hmm. and after like a week and a half i had nobody to play with <laughs> so yeah, it's cool. it's you got to pick your your games carefully. I yeah, think. and I think this one probably has some some legs to it. Yeah, I, I also think you know a couple times playing this where I just thought like I can't believe this exists. Yeah, I can't believe somebody <laughs> made this. Like it, it, somebody greenlit the the funding for it and like it's one of the, it, this is like one of those games I feel like you'd think about oh it'd be cool if this existed. Yeah, but it does. And it does. Yeah. So and one day I'm sure it'll be way better. I get I feel like I, you know this is like a thing like 10, 15 years down the road. 
you'll have like an MMO that's like this. Right. Where, like everybody's yeah, got, yeah. you know, crews and people just flying around and doing stuff. And like that Klingon ship that's, you know, guarding the neutral zone is full of other players. Right. And just an NPC. No, it's going to happen. Yeah. It may be a while, but it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Not this gen. No, but. definitely not. <laughs> Yeah, it, we're just lucky that this game looks as good as it does right now, to be honest with you. it's one yeah. I think it's one of the better-looking PlayStation VR games, in my opinion, anyway. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Nintendo. Um, Nintendo made a couple announcements, just to, and again, an advantage of us to win this show on Friday. Uh, Nintendo announced late last night uh, its online service has been delayed mm. and won't be... It will be free all the way through 2017, and then early 2018 is when it's going to shift to a paid service. Uh, but the good, well, actually, that's good news, I think, that we're going to be able to play for free all year. So right. you'll be able to play Splatoon 2 and ARMS all year for free, Mario Kart as well. So although it, is, it does raise a question, like, you, you knew the system was out in March, right? right? <laughs> like you, well, well, we'll get you, to some of the You hired really a whole company to do this. Yeah. The good news, and even better news, I guess is a better way to put it, is that it's only going to cost $20 a year, and it's going to give you a Netflix-style Nintendo service that lets you play a rotating selection of classic Nintendo games for 20 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Maybe. I mean, a lot of it depends on the games. What are the games? How many do you get? Um, right now, I think they're all NES games, which yeah. we've all played a thousand times. Well, after the NES Classic, right. everyone's played through all the, class the classics for... For that platform at this point, yeah, ad nauseum, and we've all we've played been playing them for decades. So yeah, and it's like okay, I can play Super Mario Brothers three for free. It's like I could play that for free on like four other platforms I own. You know, it's like, yeah. So I, hopefully they're going and and it's, it, it still feels unclear to me that like you know so it will be like Netflix where they rotate some out and some back in. Like probably you know, yeah. So so you only have limited access. Well, they, I mean, the, Nintendo has already said that that's going to be the case. Right. That you won't own that game. Right. That it will go away, but then conceivably be replaced with something else. Um, In the meantime, hope you like Balloon Fight. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. What well, what what I'm hoping is that Nintendo basically every month gives you at least one or two games from every one of its platforms. And I realize that'll probably cut off at the N64. Mm. I'm guessing. I doubt we're going to see GameCube games on the service. Although you never know. That's um, a big download for something you don't know. It would be, yeah. Um, but it would be cool, you know, if you get one from the NES, Super NES, N64 mm. every month. Or maybe two from each every right month. Right now they don't seem to be willing to commit to that. No. The, the, I, I think IGN uh, sent them, like, questions that they were, and all the responses were basically like, we have no further announcements. We have no... yeah. But they did seem to confirm that Super Nintendo is not off the table, but it's not happening. Yet. Yeah. Um, which surprised. is too bad because it's like Super Nintendo is more compelling to me in that in that sense. I'm surprised Nintendo didn't hold this announcement for E3. Um, did they? Uh, yeah, why didn't they do that? I think maybe Nintendo views it as bad news. That could be. <laughs> Although I don't think it is. Like I think getting online free all year and then it only being twenty bucks and then getting online plus all these games, yeah, I think that's I mean, good news. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can see Nintendo thinking it makes them look kind of. Unprepared, which it, it does. It does probably not. <laughs> probably not something that you want to really put in your carefully produced Nintendo Direct. Well, you want E3 it to thing. be all rainbows, unicorns, yeah. and sunshine at E3. You don't want anything to yeah. deliver. And, that and I message. think like one of the key things there is like you know if you if you say it now, the enthusiast press picks it up, and we all talk about it now. But if you do it at E3, CNN talks about it. Right. So that's a good point. Probably yeah. better that probably more they do, they don't they don't want this to be mainstream news. And because uh, most people, you know, if mainstream people pick up the Switch, are probably going to pick it up near the end of the year, closer to Christmas, which is close enough to 2018 that, like, who cares? Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, essentially, it'd be the equivalent to them. It was equivalent to us, where it's like we thought they were going to go live with this stuff in like the summer, which right. is a few months. So yeah. you get it around Christmas, you it's going to go live in a few months. So it's yeah. not, any, not any different than what we did. Um, and then the people it gets who, all delayed a year. Yeah. <laughs> and people, the people who did who. Um, and then the people who we bought it early, like at least we get free online or you know, for whatever yeah. form that takes for the rest of 2017. Now the bad news. So the bad news is in Japan, Hori, which is a peripheral maker from Japan. Mm. Uh, Unfortunate it, name, but yeah, in English. It is. Um, basically revealed how the Nintendo Switch's voice chat is going to work. It, mm. it debuted one of the peripherals for Splatoon 2, and yeah. it's like this squid-shaped... You actually can see it there in the image in the bottom mm. corner. Um, it's basically this squid-shaped device that becomes the hub for voice chat. 
And at least if you wanted to use a headset with it, right? So, like, so this is for like seems to be the setup for people who want to use a headset with the game sound and voice chat in the same yeah. headset. So which, which, which is I think everybody, is a lot of people. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> which is everyone. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry we don't have a bigger image of it, but that's the biggest size they released, so we decided to use it as kind of the thumbnail for this topic instead of just putting that little dicky square in the center of the screen, but hopefully you can make it out well enough. Essentially, it is just this mad spaghetti of mm. wires. You need, let's see, you're going in, a wire goes into your phone, a wire goes into the switch, and then there's a third wire. I can't remember where that one goes. But there's essentially three wires that you have to attach into this squid-shaped device just to voice chat online. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is just utter Well, don't forget, like, if you have a modern iPhone, you don't even have a headphone jack. Right, right? So, so you, you have to have the have lightning have the, adapter the, the, or whatever. adapter. Yeah. And hopefully you have an adapter that also lets you charge at the same time. <sighs> what, are they, what is Nintendo thinking here? Well, clearly they're trying to keep, you know what they would view as unnecessary baggage off of the OS because the system's only got so much power to go around as it is. Um, but so voice like, so chat worked on the Wii U. And all I had to do was just plug my headset right into the gamepad and off I went. Why would they make it worse? Because do they, they don't know what they're... I mean, this this to me smacks of uh, DNA, the the company, yeah. the, uh, you know, the mobile company. Yeah. They're basically hired to kind of handle a lot of this stuff for them. Um it just seems like it almost makes me wonder if like they decided to stick in their their comfortable wheelhouse which is making smartphone apps as opposed to kind of integrating it into the system and then nintendo was like well we don't want more footprint from the system os anyway so fine um i, like, I don't know what the rationale is here like you think part of it might be trying to create a barrier of entry for the younger players so that ultimately they just can't Get on voice chat. Possibly, but who cares at this point? Nintendo like, does still care. But, like... It's the only company left on the planet all, that cares. But they're already, like, you know, kids are already on YouTube. They're on everything. I know. It's not a thing. It's not something Nintendo needs to prevent anymore. Like, it's it's a fact of life now. It's something parents monitor and handle. Like, it's not a thing that Nintendo needs to police themselves anymore. It does, though. It feels like it needs to. Maybe. I mean, the friend code thing sure is still here. Yeah, which is equally annoying. For, you're right, and that's why I'm thinking it is some kind of a fail-safe for Nintendo. I, I feel like Nintendo is in constant fear of being sued by a parent. And that everything mm -hmm. it does is in hopes of, if that day ever comes, having a defense in some way or another. <laughs> like, I just can't understand any other reason why it would do something this way, particularly after... It had already done it a different way and done it pretty well. I mean, the voice chat on Wii U was fine. I, I didn't really have any issues with it. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it is just, I still think it's coming from how underpowered the Switch is, and they just don't want to use any extra horsepower powering any kind of extraneous thing, so they offload it to the phone. Um, I think it's silly, but, you know, I mean, it makes more sense to... Just make your system a little stronger. They can handle that, but there yeah. you go. Like I, it's just you know, there's a lot of compromise on this system in terms of the, how the hardware works and 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 you know, trying to be a jack of all trades. And this seems to be kind of the place it really drops the ball. Well, how about just having to buy an extra peripheral to have real voice chat on Switch? Well, I think like the only, I think it'll work. Voice chat will should work fine on just your phone, just with your phone, right? This is if you want to play it, you know, as I think a lot of, I don't, I don't, but I think a lot of people do play with a full headset with the game sound and the voice chat in one headset, you know? Yeah. That's how a lot of people... That's how we've all played for forever. do not want to be, um, well, I don't, I mean, I, the headsets I use on, like, the 360 and stuff is just, I just use the thing that came with it, the voice chats and the headset, the sounds on the TV. Yeah. Um, but I think more and more over the last, you know, five years, people have started to use the full all-in-one headsets because it lets them... You know, you know, you got some really high quality headsets now that like you know makes the sound sound really good. Yeah. And it means you, you can play it loud and not disturb anyone one at night. And you know, it's, it's very important for people who live with their parents or live with a, a wife that is not as tolerant as yours. Yeah. Um. You know, it would it would solve a lot of fights over Persona Five. Um, <laughs> so like, yeah. I don't do it, but it's like you know, I it's I would say you know probably over 50% of, like, at least adult gamers do that. Well, I think, too, is, you know, there's a big push with Splatoon and ARMS into eSports. Mm -hmm. uh, they're having tournaments for both games at E3. Uh, 
the creator of ARMS went on record today saying that, you know, we've built this with the idea that it will become, mm -hmm. or at least in hopes that it will become an esports sensation. Good uh, luck. Yeah. <laughs> and look, people who are serious into esports absolutely are going to use full on cans. Yeah. And so I, I'm just flabbergasted. It's just. It's just crazy to me. Just look at that schematic down there. <laughs> look at that. Yeah, it's not ideal. Definitely not. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess one good thing is it seems like Nintendo's handled the Switch pretty well in every other way at this point. Uh, so having sort of yeah. one downside. This just seems to be the, the two meter exhaust port weakness. But like, you know, I mean, I guess technically like it's, it's only affecting a, a, a portion you know, because I can't think of any reason I would use voice chat on this system at this point because I don't care about ARMS or probably Splatoon 2. Yeah. Um, at least not or enough, Mario Kart. At least not enough to chat. Like, I don't, I don't need chat in Mario Kart. I'm, I'm fine with that. There's not a lot of teamwork happening in most of these except Splatoon. Yeah. Um, you know, with ARMS, the only reason you would chat is to talk trash to the yeah. person you're playing against. Um, so, like, it's not a big deal to me, but it does sort of mean, like, you know, if you're if you're excited for, like, Monster Hunter that's coming now yeah you, you get used to that setup because that's pretty much what you're going to have to have because you can't play monster hunter without communication no you absolutely can't you can try and it's a yeah. disaster but <laughs> it's not going to work so and of course on top of you know, i mean i guess people aren't probably going to be playing online on the go really no matter how much people like talk about how oh i can play splatoon on the train like yeah well not when you got like no wi-fi you know, it's... well actually some people did some tests during the uh the splatoon beta using their mobile phones as a hotspot and actually said that it played fine using their mobile hotspots. Hmm. The uh, amount of data that the game is sending <coughs> is really minuscule. And I don't know if that was intentional on Nintendo's part, but initial reports are that you can, in fact, play uh, Splatoon 2 over a mobile hotspot with very little issues. So That's impressive. It is, yeah. Um, it's good to see that Nintendo's sort of taken netcode to heart and actually thinking about it. So... I'm sure we'll hear more about this at E3. Um, I think that's probably one piece of Nintendo news that Nintendo did want to get out before E3. Maybe, yeah. maybe it told Hori, hey, why don't you just put those images on out right now? I, mean, you know, I figure they're probably not going to focus on something like that. They're going to focus on like kind of the app. And when, yeah. been, whenever they show it, it sounds like we won't see it probably this, this E3. Yeah. I and I'm wondering, too, if Nintendo will make its own first-party peripheral instead of just letting Hori do it all. Eh. It seems to be an officially licensed one. Yeah, I mean, Hori. I feel like they wouldn't be able to make it the Squid logo if it right. wasn't official. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe Nintendo's just sort Not of... Not that Hori makes junk or anything. No, Hori, Hori makes, makes good great products, products, but it's just like, um, you know, maybe Nintendo just sort of figures, like, you know, you might as well offload that to Hori because, you know, their, their bread and butter audience is not going to be buying that. Yeah, you're for right. Like, for the most part. You're right. Unless Mario Odyssey has a robust multiplayer mode we don't know about yet. Which I, I hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about another announcement that came out this week. All the E3 stuff is starting to filter in now. Uh, we're about a week plus a couple days out. So people are starting to make declarations of whether they're going to be at the show or whether they're not going to be at the show. We talked last week about how Beyond Good and Evil is not going to be at E3. Now this week... It's announced Shenmue 3 will not be at E3 in any way, shape, or form. Shocker. Are you not shocked by that at all? No. Really? Two years after? No. I mean, like, first off, where are they going to do it? Like, I mean, Sony's Sony, I guess. Or, yeah. um, second, that's a hard game to do a vertical slice on. Uh, third, uh, what the estimated delivery date was December this year. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to come out in December 2018 at the earliest. That's, that's rule of thumb. If, yeah. if, a, if a game Kickstarter add a year to their estimated delivery time, and that's about when Maybe you Maybe when you it. get it. <laughs> uh, the only game I can think of in recent years that delivered before that, a year after, was actually Mighty Number no. 9. Yeah, you're right. Which came yeah. out, I think, like, beat, beat their post-year deadline by about a few months, but was still criticized for being late because they kept announcing release dates. Right, yeah, they made the mistake of, like, okay, we're delaying it in a month. Yeah. Instead of saying, we're going to delay it eight months... They kept saying two months, another yeah, month, month, two more months. months. That yeah, that was terrible. So yeah. it's like, um, so yeah, just you know, if your Kickstarter game, just wait and announce, you know, when you're sure. So you're thinking twenty Christmas 2018 for if, this? Maybe earliest. That's the what I'm absolute thinking. earliest. I am disappointed and shocked that they have nothing to show. 
at I'm not. I mean, they're, they're it's not been a, two years. Yeah, but they're also not a huge team, and they don't have they don't have the resources or the bandwidth to like make an E3 demo. But because, you also got to realize, like when they announced this Kickstarter that we're seeing right now, they had like some footage of it already. Well, yeah, but that's proof of concept stuff. That's yeah. not like the actual development work, and like they got to get the game done. I mean. Yeah, and and certainly, I think like doing it. You know, I, I'm gonna guess they're a year and a half minimum out from release, and showing the game that early at E3 doesn't do them any good. Like, I, you know, it's it's not gonna be all that because people forget about it by the time it's time for people to really who haven't backed it to really plunk down the money to buy the thing. It makes more sense to do it next year. Or look, let's be freaking honest, E3 2019 because it's probably gonna slip to to, to summer. Like. I'm, <laughs> You slip it, to, you know. Wow. Slip, it, slip it that. I mean, these Kickstarter games take a long time. There's always underestimation of how much how much things are going to cost and how long it's going to take. There was a whole thing. You know, there was a whole other thing with uh, uh, Richard Garriott's Kickstarter game, Shroud of the Avatar. Like they had like some investment site that was up and and people and like where they had to kind of disclose like a lot of their financial situation and a lot of the backers saw it and were like, how do you? You know, you made two or three million dollars off of the Kickstarter and the pledges. How do you only have five hundred thousand dollars left? Yeah. And the game isn't, you know, isn't anywhere near what people said it was going to be. So, um, like, you know, for the Kickstarter stuff, I basically throw my money in the hole and hope something pops call, back you know, out. Call, call me when call <laughs> me when it's done. Yeah, you know? wrap it pops out eventually. I just don't worry about it. Yeah, you know, like Shenmue Three. You know, and I get the the updates. You know, they they rip pretty regularly update. You know with like little mailing list things for Shenmue 3 and like you know I assume they're working on it as much fast as they can but it's like uh, not popping up at E3 I don't really care about that this year because I, I know it's a year and a half out minimum and and you know I'd rather do this keep working on the game uh, do you worry though that it, they run out of money could be because I mean in all honesty that crowdfunding program wasn't that big no but they had other investors that were going to jump in if the crowdfunding was successful, so you know some of their money must be coming from that. Yeah, um, it's a good question. You know, who knows? And we'll see. You know, you never know. You don't. You know, despite how transparent these Kickstarter things try to be with the with the the backers, you never know when they're going to suddenly pop up and be like, "Oh, by the way, we're we screwed up. And we have, we're out of money and we're done." You know? Yeah. And I'm. You know, everybody seems to be expecting Star Citizen to do that any day now. Although um, they're at like. Yeah, they're still doing all right in terms of regular influxes <laughs> Holy of cash. Cow. Um, I think they're on track. Uh, right now, they're the second most expensive game of all time. I know. Behind uh, Swotor. It's unreal. Because Old Republic cost $200 million. I don't know how that's even possible um, for when it was developed. A lot of voice. It'll be, well, it took forever. And tons of content, tons of models, tons of voice acting, tons of re-recording. And by the way, I, I, I don't know how accurate this is, but I did see some, some reports on it uh, a couple years ago. You know how much money they spent marketing that game? Probably not much. $10 million. Yeah. So at $200 million on I the game, I remember it, it was not marketed it. that no, way. it was very that's little. That's not how happening. it worked. And it's like... That's not typically how it works. No. It's like if you spend $100 million developing the game, you spend like $60 million at like least. marketing it. Yeah. yeah. It's like with movies, you assume, you know, you take the budget and you double it. That's, yeah. And that's you the budget You spend more on the marketing, marketing than the movie. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, so in the end, I mean, Star Citizen has a real chance to be the most expensive game ever made. Uh, I believe at the time of its release, Shenmue One was the most expensive. It game was, ever yeah, made. something like sixty. By million. a long way, yeah. Like, yeah, like it, nothing like it had ever been attempted. And they only asked three million in the crowdfunding for this. Something like that. <laughs> I, don't I mean, know, to be man. fair, part of the reason the first one cost so much is they had to invent the tech. Right. Well, they had to create a genre essentially, yeah. and they did. And it took what four years, yeah. which at the time was a long development yeah. cycle because originally it was a Saturn game. Yeah. Um, but like. And again, like you need I need to go back and redo all your assets. Yeah, and, yeah. and p again, part of my concern about Shenmue Three is probably just that I wonder if there's a place for it in today's world. You know, like it's that genre has moved on. Yeah, moved really moved way on. on. And like, I mean, you could you could <laughs> consider like the modern Telltale games, you know, yeah. a descendant in some yeah, ways. Yeah, I guess so. Um, Story driven, kind of three D exploration stuff. I mean, you know, obviously not as freeform as Shenmue. Yeah. But uh, that's where a lot of that comes from, and like, you can see it in the original game where they didn't really know how to let you control it yet. No. You know? Like they didn't know what the you know you 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 steered him with with the stick, but you made him move forward with the trigger. Right, it's you know, crazy. It, 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 like the, it's there was actually, like, there were a lot game. of Japanese games back in that era that were controlled like that, mm -hmm. where you had a button to actually, like, move. Yeah, like, there, it was still kind of that period where it was like, you know, and again, uh, Shenmue 1 was uh, a year after, 
not even a year after release in Japan at least, not even a year after Ocarina. So you were you were kind of running this thing where like Ocarina codified how a lot of 3D game controls worked. Yeah. And you sort of had this couple years of lag time when people who had started development on their games before they played Ocarina were like, well, this is what we chose. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> this is the best we can do. Um, and I just, you know, they, they modified it and made it a little more functional in Shenmue 2, especially the Xbox version. But, um, like, I just wonder about this game because it's like if you make it fully modern, I wonder if you're alienating the people that want Shenmue. And if you make it Shenmue, are you alienating the people that want to play a game yeah you know, you know like, <laughs> yeah, like, and i'm a big shenmue fan i'm not you know not you know trying i mean to rag i enjoyed on the it game, but time, it's like but this thing you know the the, the sequel is what 15 16 years old yeah holy cow think about that i mean think think about a game of 16 years old when when they came out yeah that would have been like pac-man yeah the first i know game or so or you know that's a law that's an eternity in video game ter- development terms I-, I would be shocked if we don't at least get some kind of new footage or a trailer or something for this i mean t- two years on you have to have something to show yes i mean sure they must have some foot and they do put up footage and a little behind the scenes thing you know footage of characters and you know most of it's in like dev tools but, yeah you know, they don't really show if you're a backer anything. you've seen a fair amount of content it's just not in a you know trailer presentation right um but I mean, because, look, there's, there, there's two parts of this. They're satisfying the backers, mm-hmm. but then the other part of it is making the game a success. Right, but I just don't think it's time for that yet. It's too far out. You know, we just talked about, like, it makes no sense doing it. And you had to announce it two years ago because that was the launch of the Kickstarter. Right. It's, not like, it's not like Final Fantasy VII Remake where it's like, here's a game. Oh, yeah, two years later, we're just going to start it. You know, it's, it, you know, although it sounds like they were doing some outside development with it, and Square has decided to take it internally and kind of start over. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, in terms of, like, announcing too early, I think, uh, like, Final Fantasy, like, Final Fantasy VII Remake is a different beast than Shenmue 3, because Shenmue 3, you, you had to make a bit of a splash to get the backer interest going. And now you just sort of have to settle in for the long wait. And frankly, in terms of games that have taken a long time to develop off of a Kickstarter... Shenmue 3 ain't even in the top 40. I know. know? I just... It's it's a long process. How do you make an epic open world action adventure on that little money? Because they have more money than that. No, I understand that. But do you think that, like, their other backers even triple that? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, they are working with Unreal. It's not, not, you know, it's not like it's... That's a free license, though. Yeah. But it's also not like uh, they have to spend a ton of money to, for the tools, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So it might just be pure development. I mean, the, the major cost of any game development manpower. cycle is man, you know, hiring on everybody and keeping them paid for yeah. however many years it takes you to do that. That money goes fast. Yeah. Real fast. And as a couple, you know, Shroud of the Avatar is learning. Um, they, yeah. That's a, they, they, you know, nobody, there's a whole thing on Reddit right now where everybody's arguing over whether it's, a, you know, it's, I mean, people keep calling it a scam. It's clearly not a scam. Shroud of the Avatar has been playable for two years or right. something like that you know, longer than that yeah um it's been shown at pax and shown you know it's clearly it's there it's a game they've working on it gary wants to make it it's a real thing <coughs> but is it going to be finished match up to what <laughs> a match up to what they promised and b something that would be recognizable as something made in 2017 i mean it's, ostensibly its release date is i think july 31st yeah is i mean it's not even out of alpha no nope. so what's yeah what's which means on? they're not hitting that date <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, the, the Kickstarter phenomenon is interesting, and you get like people that are a, you know, dedicated to the idea that they've based, they're customers and they've they've paid money and they deserve a product, and uh, you know, I, I think the FTC kind of backs them on a case case by case basis in that regard. But you are basically gambling when you when you do these you backer are. things. And I, look, I'm not hating on Yu Suzuki all that much because. You have Iga working on Bloodstained, mm-hmm. which is a 2D Castlevania, essentially. And he just announced a couple months ago that that's not coming out for, like, another two years. Yeah. And that's where I'm really wondering what the hell's going on with the money. And if they're going to have enough money to actually finish that game, there's no reason a 2D Castlevania game should take that long to make. It's like you got to wonder, like, you know, because you know, that's the other thing. You know, I think he ran into that with... Uh... Maybe that's why he and Konami parted ways, by the way. Maybe. But, like, uh, the other thing is, like, um, certainly why they parted ways because Jima. Yeah. Um, it is. It's exactly why. The other thing is, like, you know, like with um, Inafune and uh, and Mega Man, uh, or Mighty Number no. Nine, um, which again, how do you not get sued for that thing? Um, I don't know. Like you know, there's there's people that talked about how like yeah, he's he's not 
you know, he's not a business guy or he's or he's not a developer guy. Like there's these guys that like either they know how the money works or they know how the development works. And if the guys who know how the development works don't necessarily have to know how the money works, and that's when you run into problems because they don't have they're used to having someone else to handle that. Yeah, in accounting right. or something. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have to worry about that, and they don't realize how fast the money gets. They look at the bank account one day, and they're like, "Holy yeah. crap!" And I mean, wait, we, we work. We worked in production for multiple, you know, ma- major corporations. We never thought about how much money we were spending on a daily yeah. basis to make these shows. We, our job was to make the show. Right. You go and you talk to your line producer yeah. or your or the person who runs billing, and you they say, "This is the budget that you have." And as you start doing stuff, they come to you and they say, "Hey, yeah. you're starting to spend a little too much. You might want to dial mm-hmm. back." And then you sit down with them, you're like, "Okay, well, what can we cut?" from the plant and yeah you're right if you don't have that person to come to you and do that and you're purely a creative person it's very mm-hmm. easy to get in over your head and you know firsthand about having to strike that balance now in your yes. own company exactly so. yeah and i have kind of had to transition from this person who worried about creative and content to this person who now runs a business mm-hmm. and uh, you know i worked with budgets in my prior jobs and everything they'd say okay well this is what you've got and then you need to figure out what you're going to spend this year um, but I don't have like that little fairy sitting on my shoulder now who would come to me and be like, Hey, you know, you, you went a little bit over on Tokyo game show. Um, and now you have packs coming up and you want to do this, this, and this, you maybe need to cut something back. Like you're right. One person can only do so much is what it comes mm-hmm. down to. I mean, some people are better than others at certain things, but ultimately there's only so much time in a day in a person's life. And inevitably some things will start to slip through the cracks. And I think that's what happens with a lot of crowdfunded projects mm-hmm. is that people aren't used to having that role like you said and they aren't watching it as closely as they should be because they may look at that big number oh we got three million dollars right wow that's so much money yeah. i couldn't even i couldn't even count that much money yeah but when you start but thinking like, about that's it, that's about three months of dev right it, <laughs> exactly know, so. and you start thinking about it you're like every person on that team is probably getting paid 10 grand a month if they have eight or nine guys or 10 guys probably mm-hmm. that's a lot, that's a Let hundred, alone how much you burn through just getting an office. That's a hundred grand a month desks, right there. Oh, chairs. Yeah. Paying your rent every month yeah. and your electricity and all the licenses that you need. Hey, man, it's, it goes fast. So mm-hmm. I'm getting a little nervous about Shenmue 3. Um, I'm not too nervous about it. I just, you know, I'll worry about it more if like we get to like December 2018 and we still haven't seen anything. Um, really? Least. You won't get nervous until then? If no. you haven't seen anything a Nothing, year and a half I, from now? I don't care. Until you're a year after your you know, your false estimated delivery <laughs> date, like that's that's yeah. the that when when you pass that line, because look, I've got one game in my Kickstarter like backer listing. Uh, the delivery date was t- October 2012. Wow! And they still have never delivered anything. So that's just a scam. No, it's just it's just people that didn't know what they were doing. And so they they got, just took the money and spent it. No, and... they're still doing updates and saying this is it. Like it's still active. Oh but wow! It's, it's, you know, five years later, and they're like, uh, we might have a demo out soon. Uh, I don't even remember the name of it. It was like some kind of JRPG-ish sort of thing yeah. that somebody was doing that, like, looked kind of fun. But, like, I just, I'm the opposite, I though. backed it for, like, ten bucks. I don't care. Yeah, you know? yeah. Or, like, Clang. You remember Clang? Yeah, which yeah. was, uh, uh, was that Neil Stevenson that did that? Like, the, the writer? Uh, I don't remember. I can't remember who that was. It was some major writer who, who did that. And basically, like, it was supposed to be, like, a full, like, motion-controlled, like, you know, combat simulation with yeah. like melee combat like swords and stuff and eventually uh they, like, they put out like a, a weak demo like a really like janky demo and then like two months later we're like oh yeah that's it we're done and i was like no we paid Love for the game, game. <laughs> and they're, they're like well we never promised a game we just were saying we we're gonna do a proof of concept demo and they're like no that's totally not what that said yeah and like, basically they overpaid back, themselves and it went back and forth and once they ran out of money also, they're just like that's it that's what, what they wanted to do was way harder than what they can you know like they don't think about how hard what they wanted to do was yeah, it's like yeah. it's like there's a reason that game doesn't exist yeah you know? because it'll take a lot of resources to make it it's the same like with uh, uh like star trek bridge crew it's like yeah. there's a reason that it took ubisoft to make that a game. big publisher yeah. you know and, and again you know artemis is a totally independent game by like one dude who, but it took me years and years and years and years of working in his free time to get it up to even a level that you could kind of play functionally as a normal person who didn't know how it worked from the code level right. you know um, you just... have a lot more confidence in Shenmue 3 than I do. I'm already a little nervous, and if we don't see... I'll be even more nervous if we don't get anything at E3, at least a trailer. And if we don't see, like, the first glimpses of gameplay by the end of this year, I'll be getting real nervous. I think it would be, it'd be reasonable to expect, ga- like, some gameplay footage by the end of the year. I don't expect to see anything at E3. No trailer, no nothing. 
Um, I mean, otherwise, why would why would they say that? Um, unless they just just they, unless they just mean by not at E3, they mean we don't have a we don't have a kiosk like in the Sony booth. Yeah. Um, but I get the feel I get the impression from their announcement that you will not see Shenmue mentioned, basically. That's what it sounds like. So. We'll see. It's time to move on and talk about more E3. We're going to talk about Ubisoft first. Ubisoft has been in the news a lot uh, over the last couple weeks. Uh, one of the big things that they did this this week was they announced a new logo, mm. which you're seeing down there right now. It is, they say, a more simplified logo from their older logo. It's monochromatic, just one color. Um, they said it's supposed to represent their new stance as games as a service. Yeah, I, I read really that. Have I don't no get idea. It. I don't get it either. I have no idea how that logo. It looks like a mildly that. annoyed eye to yeah. me. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know it's basically just the swirl they've had for like the last fifteen years or so. But yeah, so Ubisoft has actually been pretty pre pro proactive about E3. Uh, I put out a hype trailer yesterday, which Sam has that he can run. Um, and I will say in this hype trailer, if you go by this thing that th that they put out yesterday. It appears that they have like five or six reveals. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is all in jest, and but like throughout here, you'll see periodically throughout this trailer, it'll pause and say, "Can't show this reveal. Can't show this brand new game. Hmm. Can't talk about this new feature." Oh, God, so the Orpheum. yeah, see right there, like yeah, and new IP yeah. save for conference. Like they do this all the way through. Mm -hmm. And if you if you actually count these, there's like five or six moments in the trailer where they're saying, "We can't show you something." So. It could be all baloney, mm. but if you hold them to their word, there should be five or six big reveals from Ubisoft at the show. My big concern is that this may be Ubisoft's last E3 as a Ubisoft we all know and love. Mm. Which is, I think it's interesting that they're not using Aisha Tyler. Yeah. Uh, and it's all hosted by the devs. Yeah. It's almost, it almost feels, because remember last year they got up at the end and kind of did a whole, they almost said goodbye a little yeah. bit at the end. Yeah. And I'm kind of, this almost feels like a continuation of that, where it's like, okay, if this is our last hurrah, let's get everybody up on stage to talk about their games in person, and, and we, everyone can see them and know who they are, and know who they are when it's time to look for a new job. Right. Because um, it's like, look, if there's a, if there's no better way, probably in, in this context, if this is going to happen with Vivendi, to you know make sure that everybody has somewhere to land than by putting them up in front of the whole industry at this conference. I think if this happens, there are so many rich people at Ubisoft. Yeah. And for good reason. They've made great games for years and Although years. Although a lot of the people that made the games what they are are not rich. Let's not forget. Right, right. A lot, a lot, of, a lot of toilers in the, in, the, in, the, in the hallways and trenches. I'm just thinking about the capital that Ubisoft has mm -hmm. right now. That it could potentially, if Vivendi goes through with the hostile takeover... Those people just take their money and just start something else. And then they mm -hmm. keep it private this time and never go IPO and open themselves up to what's happening right now. But we literally could be seeing the last legitimate Ubisoft press conference at this year's E3, the which makes me a little Ubisoft sad. Show. Yeah, I mean, it, it sucks, I think. It's, yeah. But, you at know, least Ubisoft as we know it. Yeah, I mean, that's the risk you take when you go public, though, with a company. It's like, once mm -hmm. you do that, you open yourself up to, the, to this sort of thing. Particularly in the Vivendi, in, uh, industry Vivendi is interested in, apparently, because this seems to be just what they do. But I don't get it either. Vivendi was a publisher, and it got out. Mm -hmm. So why does it want back in? I don't understand it. they think they can cannibalize it and, and you know, raise, raise the value and, and then get out and make a profit. I, I think what we're seeing with, like, Metal Gear, with that corny multiplayer shooter that Konami's trying to barf out, which we haven't seen for a long time, mind yeah. you. I'm starting to wonder what's up with that. Um, but I think what you're seeing, though, is it Hopefully really... Hopefully, mercy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Gone. I think, I think what you're seeing, though, is that an IP can only take you so far. It really yeah. is the people who make the games, and especially with the modern age, with information overload. Um, everybody knows that something is good or bad anymore. Nobody buys games anymore looking at screenshots on the back of a box. And I wonder, like, how, you know, you're gonna if if Vivendi takes over and really screws the pooch on this, like you're gonna lose a lot of what makes Ubisoft valuable. You're gonna, you yeah. know, the South Park guys won't work with people they think are no way. Yeah, uh, you know, James Cameron isn't gonna, gonna, gonna trust like you know James Cameron uh, clearly. I mean, although he his, may actually trust a big conglomerate like somewhat, Vivendi. <laughs> but, well, I don't know. Cameron's a, Cameron's a big auteur guy, so yeah. like, he may not. I mean, he clearly shopped the Avatar thing around a lot when, uh, before choosing who would make the game in the original, because, I mean, he talked about it for 15 frickin' minutes yeah. with no B-roll yeah, yeah. you know, back in the day. And, like, I can see him, like, not wanting to be 
part of a you know some some of this. I mean, you know, he does have a good relationship. With he does, and like I think you know, if Vivendi turns this into some kind of like you know acclaim equivalent, like you know, just push the license game out and make the money and walk away, like that's not what James Cameron's about. Yeah. So that could be a problem, and. Um, yeah, How do you feel like, about Aisha Tyler not hosting the press conference? I like Aisha Tyler. I, I, I mean, she's corny at times and like a little like, you know, I know people think she's too vulgar for a video game press conference, whatever that means. It's like, it's like, oh no, like someone said fuck on the thing where we just watched 14 heads explode. You know, it's like, <laughs> who gives a shit? Yeah. Um, but I like her. I think she adds personality to it and she, and she's into it. She's, she's legitimately She's knowledgeable. Into the she's gaming. A, she she's, plays games. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's as excited to be there as we are. Yeah. Um, so I, I like her presence in that. I was so surprised I, the response on Sifted, almost everybody was like, I don't, I'm glad she's not there. I don't like her. Yeah, I was I really surprised by that. I thought I like of all the press conferences, Ubisoft generally has the best host. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be Mr. Coffee. Right. <laughs> I wonder if they. I wonder if their dislike for Aisha might be a little bit of a hangover from some of the antics that Ubisoft had at its press conferences. Possibly. Prior. I mean, because look, Ubisoft is absolutely guilty of doing making some terrible decisions. It still, even last year with the, all the Just Dance cra- and just. Yeah. I mean. I mean, They're not infallible. I, and also, I'm kind of comparing it to you know, stuff like Mr. Coffee, stuff like uh, Joel McHale, who right. was adequate but not fantastic. And yeah. sometimes it felt like he didn't even know. It felt like they were changing the show without telling him yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Like the time when the laser tag. You remember that? The yeah, laser tag yeah. thing? And oh, it's yeah. like, what happened to that? That should disappear <laughs> to that trace. <laughs> Ubisoft always does that, it's though. probably in a, in a closet somewhere with the Nintendo Vitality sensor. But that's one of the things I like about Ubisoft is that it does put things in its press conferences that Mm -hmm. are kind of pie-in-the-sky ideas. And I don't know if it's kind of Ubisoft's way of focus testing something before it really decides to go full bore with it. It, It's a very very high-profile way of experimenting. It is. But they're a wild card, and I like that about them. They're not as buttoned up as a lot of the other publishers are, yet they make some of the most buttoned-up games in the industry. And sometimes not. I mean, you know, like that Mario Rabbids thing... Because yeah. I don't know how I don't know how much of those slides that leaked we were supposed to ever see because they looked that looked like an internal presentation right. thing yeah. to me it didn't look like marketing, um, especially with all the typos. But like just the like, kind of the whole like there was moments in that in those slides where they're just like it's like you know screw this like we're just gonna go crazy like, you know, and it was like kind of the whole like oh no one will ex- expect a Nintendo Ubisoft game to like not take itself seriously or like make fun of their own game so we're gonna do that and it, it yeah. was like. Yeah, Ubisoft every once in a while can surprise you, despite how, you know, we know enough people that work work and have worked for them that, like, you know, they're very, they can be very conservative about what they let through. There's some, there's some, some of the most famous lines in Assassin's Creed, uh, they were nervous about putting, right. in, you know, the, the, uh, but it's like, you gotta, uh, they, they, they've kind of learned to take some more risks, and I feel like the success, even the success of Assassin's Creed and some of those, like, shot-in-the-dark IP, new IPs they've done in the last ten years have really changed the company. I think something else we've learned about Ubisoft for knowing people that work there is that it's also very nervous about paying its U.S. workers a decent wage. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> To be fair, I don't. I don't. I know. I know more Canadians who work there. I've I've known a lot of people who work for Ubisoft US who are like great experience, <laughs> terrible pay. I think that comes along a lot of times. Also, isn't Ubisoft uh, USA mostly in uh, San Francisco? It is, yeah. Which is like anything's terrible pay in San Francisco. Well, if yeah. You wanna, if you want to live anywhere, I mean, you make a hundred k in San Francisco, you're right on the edge of the poverty line, right. basically, and you're living like forty miles away from your yeah. job. Have fun in Tracy. Yeah. Or Alameda, where I lived for a while. Oh yeah, I don't think you could even afford that now. Oh, I probably yeah, I definitely couldn't. No, it's it, the, the the median house price there is something like eight hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I didn't even own a home there. I just rented an apartment. Oh, that's even worse. Like, <laughs> I used to I used to think my rent was I paid like like, God, I don't remember how much, but it was like absor- exorbitant. It was like high two thousands for like a one bedroom. Yeah, I moved there during the dot com yeah. boom. And like, I and then when we moved to LA, I got like, I think it was like two thirds of what I paid in rent for like twice the space, and yeah. I was like, this is amazing, <laughs> paradise. And it's only gotten worse. Now like, LA is right up there. With I think they else. sold that that apartment at the day I left for something like a thousand dollars a square foot. It was just like California really? yeah. <laughs> knows how to charge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they're getting better at it. <laughs> yep. All right, let's start talking about some of the games that Ubisoft's going to show. Uh, South Park, the fractured butt hole. Um, mm-hmm. Anything to say about this at this point? Just get the damn thing out. Get it done. P- put it out so I can definitively win. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah, that'll that'll pretty much do it. Um, it's like I think, October now, right? Yeah, I, I think this one's gonna stick. I think. Yeah, I think so. It's going to. Uh, we're finally gonna get to play this game. Uh, it's been delayed what twice now. That sounds right. Yeah. I mean, I think the first delay was more of kind of a, a you know, like a year to year. It's yeah. Like, oh, it's not this year; it's next year. And then, yeah. like, but this time, this delay was like it had an actual date in the spring, and now it's slipped to October. Do you show it at the press conference again? Um. Or is that just like an evil reminder of how many times it's been delayed? I think you put it in the montages. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I don't think you drag Trey and Matt out there again. Yeah. I uh, doubt they would go out there again. No. Probably not. <laughs> We'd be like, look, we did it twice, and this yeah. game hasn't come out yet. Maybe so. one of the third one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll have to come up with another juvenile pun first. Uh, but I'm excited to play that not too far away. Far Cry 5, which was just announced, that's probably going to be a big deal, its biggest focus. Yeah, unless they Except, decide to announce Steep 2. Well, the Assassin's Creed Origins will probably be... Yeah, the return of Assassin's Creed will be there. The, 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 the main event, probably. Well, I mean, look, they always seem to close their press conferences with a new IP. Yeah. Um, last year it was Steep. Talk about ending on a sour note. Oops. Yeah, and that game ended up doing hardly nothing. Yeah, that game... I came and went like a, like a snowflake. Not a bad game. No. Just... There's just not a huge market for games like that anymore. Yeah, which is funny because when you think about it, there was a time when that was one of the core pillars oh, yeah. of the game. You would have the closed a press conference with that back in 2003 or yeah. 2004. I mean, we, you know, not not 15 years ago, we lived in a world where wakeboarding unleashed got. That's greenlit. absolutely right. Yeah. Where yeah, there's I, a surfing game sitting the, of the handful of games that weren't stolen. One of them is a surfing game. Yeah, so well, no, nobody in their right mind would steal Kelly Slater Pro Surfer no, for GameCube. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Those crooks were actually smart. Yeah, like they were in here for hours and hours, and you could tell that they actually like sorted through the game. They probably sat. Well, because like, look, look how many of them are sports games. I know, you know like, I know. That, these are worth five cents. Yep, it, exactly. Yeah. Like they probably sat on their phones and went and looked on eBay at the prices for all yes, the games. Dude, no hurry. Yeah, they were here for hours. They drank a case of beer. So. I just remember, like I, those those games are. It's funny because like those old action sports games would never have been anything I really paid attention to past Tony Hawk. Yeah, but because the 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 series producer of the sh- of Extended Play before X Play. Like she was super into the action sports and X, the X Games and yeah, stuff. Yeah. We covered that stuff incessantly. Yeah. So I got super familiar with all that. And she knew all of them too. It's like, oh, for Kelly Slater, we're bringing in Kelly Slater. Yeah, for yeah. So it was like, it's like, all right, cool. Like, <laughs> You're right. I mean, we were we were on the button for, yeah, for that yeah. genre. Like she was in that whole scene, that the extreme sports scene. Yeah, she then. loved all that. So stuff. she had like all the connections, and we probably covered it a lot more than we should have because oh, of yeah. it. Uh, Far Cry Five, we know that's going to be a big game. I'm sure they're going to show probably a 10, 12 minute mm-hmm. walkthrough demo, whatever. I hope they have an embarrassing scripted co-op session yeah. to show. Like, you know, they, they love it for, they did that with the Division, and I think Rainbow Six Siege, where they like they do like the, the pre-produced video where it's supposed to be just everybody playing, but nobody's talking like anyone ever talks. And, and yeah. it's like, yeah, come on in, check out my pad. No one says no one says that about their home base in the Division. I don't even know what that means. Well, so Matt, I, ha- I have to say, we lost a premium subscriber because of our discussion last week on Far Cry 5. Oh, yeah? yeah we did, yep. Yeah, <laughs> what a tragedy. I didn't think it was bad. I thought we were very respectful, but apparently not. There's at least one person who was offended enough to cancel their subscription to sift it over it, so. Oh, well. Yep. Uh, let's see, The Crew 2, they've already announced. Um, haven't really got a look at it yet. They've just kind of announced it and put it out there. Uh I'm thinking this is like one of the games that like is the second game they show in their press conference. Yeah. They're not going to lead out the press conference with it. They're just going to let you know it exists. Yeah, they'll yeah, show like the first is. trailer. They may, like, they'll probably you know what they probably will be a, will be the United game. States again or will it be like I mean truth be told Canada. Yeah. I, I mean truth <laughs> be told you know they probably will do demos of all the games if they're getting rid of like this host that they've been paying gobs of money to every year. Yeah, it sounds like you you bring the, the whatever dev you've decided to front the game and they explain how it goes people play it on stage like it's just, you know, really what it sounds it's like straightforward is ubisoft has taken a cue from sony with the way mm-hmm. sony has done its c3 press conferences the last couple years so do you think it's not going to open with a ridiculous dance number that's going to make pactor angry you know what i can't i cannot promise that matt it's like <laughs> i can't because they do it every year it's like if they don't do something that makes pactor angry i'm going to be very disappointed <laughs> you're going to be angry 
<laughs> because that's the that's the best part about the Ubisoft press conference is watching the Pactor Factor afterward, where he just sits there and goes, "What the hell?" Like, it, yeah, I don't know why it gets to him, but he he, he hates he, it. He hates it. It really gets <laughs> under his skin. Yeah, he's not a he's not the type of guy that likes. Like, I like corny stuff sometimes. Like, mm. I, I like stuff that's so bad it's good. Not Pactor. It's like, either it has to be overtly funny, and it's supposed to be funny, and it is funny. He, he can't laugh at things that are so bad they're funny, I think mm. is what it is. Like, I get it, I guess. I'm not like I that. Mean, yeah, I, guess, I mean, his whole job is based around, you know, good optics. Yeah, yeah. So You're I right. can understand why that would, there's at no point is there so bad it's good when it comes to investment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, like, I understand where he's coming from there. That's a good point. <laughs> Uh, what else? Uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. We're going to get to look yeah. at the first Assassin's Creed in two years. I'm pretty excited about that. I'm an, but I'm Assassin's, an Assassin's Creed fan anyway. Um, even even the ones I didn't like. I yeah. I finished. Yeah. I'm, I'm weird about that. And uh, I'm ex- I mean, Ancient Egypt, like, super on board for that. Like, I have to admit, I am not excited for it at all. I'm very excited. I think I may have just reached a point where I don't care about Assassin's Creed anymore. Well, I'm interested to see what, the, you know, clearly if you take it out of circulation this long, they, they have to have come back with some new ideas, some new angles on it. The, the rumor is that um, character progression and kind of game pro- is not tied as much to game progression because, you know, in the old Assassin's Creed's like, you could grind and look for ch- you know ch- treasure chests and you know play mini Flags. games all day, yeah. but you're n- you're never going to get that second hidden blade until you complete like mission four. You right. know, uh, whereas this is the upgrading of the characters going to be more based on you know kind of a Far Cry style thing where you go out and do stuff and you just get I'm points. Sure, I'm period. sure there'll be stuff yeah. like gated behind you know certain missions, but like the fact that it'll be more kind of open ended and a little more you know he, you know the, the character we've like, I can't remember his name. Uh, From which game? The 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 new the, uh, the shirt leaked with his name on it. The, the, oh, the guy Kame the, or came... Ba some Ba Yak or something yeah. like that. How crazy is that that a T-shirt leaked like the? Yeah, <laughs> the and it's character. like it, and his name. I wish I could remember his name. His name is actually written accurately in hieroglyphics above. Oh, it his, is above the English. Ba. I want to say it's Ba Yak. I'm not sure. No, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and he's got a shield and a bow, which is weird. But um, usually you don't use one kind of a one or the other thing. Yeah. But um, <laughs> well, unless the other people have bows and he's. If a you're shield. going kind of like Horizon Zero Dawny with it, like that could be an interesting thing. And I know it's also supposedly a female main character as well, sort of the the, the Evie and like um, Syndicate, like yeah. Syndicate Evie and whatever his name is, Jacob. What do you bet that there's crafting in the game? Oh, better than average. <laughs> <laughs> better, better, better than average odds on that one. I guarantee it. Um, you're gonna be making a lot of bags out of mongooses or something. I'm yeah. Sure. Are there mongooses in ancient Egypt? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> out of snakes. I don't know if you can do. I mean, it won't be cats. They're sacred. Yeah. yeah you can't do that. Um, it's big, I mean, I think the the trappings of an ancient city is is kind of more appealing to me in this series because I, as much as I like Syndicate, I feel like you started to lose something as you move more into the modern times. Yeah. And part of the real appeal of those games was sort of this recreation of these you know, class, classical historic cities. Yeah. And, and that I mean, was half the fun of these games yeah. to me is getting just absorbed like, in. And I, they, the they got away a little bit from kind of like you know I, I do still love the first game you know flaws and all yeah. and like. Just I love that like the like Accra has a different like 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 color filter on the camera like it's a blue city it's a darker blue city and like you go to like Jerusalem and it's it's brighter and and dustier and and you know it's it's got marketplaces I mean it's, it's, like, each city in in the in the the game had a different flavor and a different look and a different feel yeah and um, they started to kind of get away more as the cities got bigger and you couldn't kind of simulate that because, you know it's all just London like I felt like it lost something that made it special as as it kind of progressed down the timeline and uh, and as and really as as gunpowder became a thing <laughs> like that's really yeah, where right. we started to kind of once lose guns money. started getting yeah. involved yeah i like, agree with that like i just and it just i think going back to the basics in that regard is going to be helpful to them do you think it can be saved at this point matt well i don't think it needed to be saved i mean the last game pretty much tanked yeah, but I think the last game was good enough that it could have recovered a bit. But it I, was a good game, though. That's yeah. the thing. And that's what I'm, why I'm wondering if people have just lost interest in it at this point. Yeah, well, we won't know until this happens. You know, until we see this thing, until we see if the ancient Egypt imagery can capture some, some uh, 
Uh, I just feel like it needs a revolutionary change, not an evolutionary revolutionary to reinvigorate the fan base. Well, hopefully and, that's what they got. I mean, and we I'm don't hoping, know anything about like, right. the basic... And I'm hoping they're a lot smarter than me because I can't really come up with something that would do that for me. Like, I yeah. think about, oh, well, maybe if it's set more in the modern world. But no, people have rejected that, and that's generally been the weaker parts of the, of the Even games. Even though that's where the game started. Right. That's the funny thing. Originally, the game was all t it was about basically the you know the, the quote unquote uh, end of the world in 2012 thing. Yeah. And they were using the DNA scanning device to like pull memories and information about stuff that they could use in the modern day. And some, at some point, someone realized like, isn't it way more interesting if you just played the historic stuff? Yeah. And that's what the game became. Um, so I don't see them totally abandoning the modern kind of animus idea. I feel like they probably need to kind of. That might have been really this part of the, the, the concept they needed to really rethink the most because I feel like the last few games, while they did a good job of keeping the, the modern day stuff out of your way, that's not really enough. Like, the, like kind of turning it into like, oh, we're playing these games as a player of a Abstergo's game console thing. Like it was a fine way of sort of continuing that theme but not making it obtrusive. But I feel like a, you know, hopefully part of this reinvention is going to be taking the modern day concept stuff and making it something you might actually care about. I always thought that that was honestly the more interesting part of the stories in the Assassin's mm -hmm. Creed games. You start dealing with the ancients and the apple and all that. It, I mean, we used to work with uh, a girl that you know that used to work at G4 as well, Megan Rue. Um, she is the world's biggest Assassin's Creed fan. And we would both, a new one would come out, and I would already play it for review, and then I'd start moving on to something else, and then it would come out, and then she'd start playing it. And then she would come into my office to talk to me about it, and like it had been two weeks since I had played it, and the stuff that she was talking about, I was just like, what the heck? Did we play the same game? Like, I did... You know, there she, is this Megan crazy... Delves. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, she knows it back and oh, forth. Yeah. And uh, there were elements of those stories that just completely went over my head that mm -hmm. she would come in and talk to me about for, like, 30 minutes. Oh, yeah. And I'd be like, wow. Like, well, there's, I, like, tidbits you can pick up in just the little, you know, the text encyclopedia yeah. things that, like, illuminate various... You know, it, it, they, they, the writers of those games put a lot of work into making like that kind of tapestry of the lore in yeah. the same way that you know the Dark Souls lore does. Um, it's just that I don't think Assassin's Creed does as good, a, or at least for the last few games, has not done as good a job of making you care enough to yeah. dig, unless you're already invested the way someone like Megan or or I mean I, I don't know the lore backwards and forwards, but I read every encyclopedia entry, yeah. especially when it's in a game where. Um, Sean is the one who wrote them because yeah. cause they're always written in character. You know, that's one of the other things I love about. Like, I hope they don't get rid of Sean Hastings. Like, he's my favorite character in the whole series. Yeah, even though everybody just thinks he's a jerk. But, I have to say that you know, I just kind of wrap it up. I'm my expectations are pretty low. I'm not all that excited for it. Um, I think it's just a case of too many games in too short a period of time. I think it's I'm just burnt out on it. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm not. I feel like uh, I thought I maybe I thought I was, but like, do you think they should ever go back to the yearly thing? I don't think any game really needs to be yearly unless it's like a sports installment game, or I guess Call, even Call with, of Duty, even if with you, the sports game. The like, problem, well, the problem with like Call of Duty kind of works yearly because it's like Call of Duty is what it is. Like everybody knows what it is. Everyone knows what it should feel like. Every, you know, you can you can move the pieces around a little bit, but it's always going to be the same thing. The problem with making Assassin's Creed yearly was always that they kept giving it to different teams. And every team had their own idea of how things should work. And yeah. you ended up with stuff where, like, features that were in last year's game are not in this year's game. Because this year's game started before yeah. last year's game implemented those features. Or, like, yeah. you know, like uh, Revelations. Um, uh, Desmond looks completely different mm -hmm. from... I mean, to be fair, he looks more Middle Eastern. And that's actually yeah. probably a better character design for him. Yeah. But it's simply not what the character has looked like for three games. Yeah. And... Suddenly he looks completely different, and then he goes back to looking kind of like the old Desmond in the next game. And it's just there's no unity to the vision. And it's kind of like what I said about you know the WWE games, where it's like they don't build on what they made before. They just tend to try and reinvent it over and over again. And, and in this case, they're having different development teams do it over and over again. And there was never any feeling of moving forward in the series. There's always just that feeling of make it again, but this time set in blank. Yep. And, like, and you need to kind of have... I think what they really need is a plan and, and a vision for what this thing should be. You would think that they, it does. <laughs> I mean, 
if you're going to publish a lot a franchise of... this big, you should absolutely have yeah. the, the, the roadmap for that franchise mapped out you for the think, next, like, I, 10 years. I think they were kind of inventing it as they went along, and there was probably a lot of intra-studio friction, like, where, like... One group thought this was the right way to go, and the other team thought this was the right way to go. That's like, the downfall of having that staggered studio approach just, to yeah, making games. Yeah, I mean, games, Ubisoft yeah. Paris can basically like lay the law down, but I don't think Ubisoft Paris is interested in micromanaging the Assassin's Creed franchise yeah. to that degree. They just want to, they just want a new version out every year. And you know, I, I mean, I did kind of get tired of the constant iteration, but I will admit, like over the years, playing the new a new Assassin's Creed game in October, November kind of became a thing. It, and yeah. To the point that last, you know, last year we didn't have one. And I went and I played Assassin's Creed Rogue in October. <laughs> in the middle of the holiday right. release season because I'm like, ah, I want to play Assassin's Creed. I never yeah. played Assassin's Creed Rogue. I never got around to it. I was, that like was that the, for a while. That but... was the last gen, uh, black, basically the pirate spinoff, Black Flag yeah. spinoff. And I never played it. And they put it out on PC and I got it for like nine bucks. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to play that. And it was great. I love it. No, it Black Flag was, was a amazing. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of fun. And um, I think that was the last year where I enjoyed that, though. That, well, month, Black that Flag, month of Assassin's yeah. Creed. Because well, I would review it every deal. year for GT. And so I was in that cycle as well where every year I mm. knew that. And I planned it out. I'm like, okay, I can't take any other games during this time period. I'm going to be playing the new Assassin's Creed. And uh, I just don't have that... Well, Black that Flag brought anymore. me back because, like, I hated Assassin's Creed Three. See, I liked it. A lot. I didn't like it. I, I thought they they ruined the the controls to a large degree. They made it. They kept, tried to make it more like automatic and intuitive, and instead they just took control away from the player. You could you can make Ezio do amazing things just because you have that direct control over each part of his body because of the kind of the puppet the marionette scheme they kind yeah. of like Patrice invented mm-hmm. for the. And then they took that away after he left and turned it into kind of this more standard and like like. I mean, Connor... There's a lot of more context-sensitive yeah, stuff. Yeah, but that's and... the problem, is because Connor, like, hops on, on and off things constantly when I don't... And, like, you know, before I had direct control over that. Same with, like, the hiding in bushes. Before, yeah. you held the trigger to go loud, and in, in Assassin's Creed... Starting with Assassin's Creed 3, as soon as you left the bush, he just stood up, and, like, all the redcoats were like... Yeah. Kill. Like, it's like my only big complaint really was the stealth stuff, the stealth specific. Well, missions everybody and, hates the eavesdropping, like follow yeah. the guy stuff. That's, I mean, that's never any. Fun. And the chases, the chases as well, because you're yeah. talking about how like they would just take control away. Oh, like yeah. you're in a chase and he would just like run up a wall. Yeah, suddenly he's just up you're a wall. Just like, no! he, he just hops up and sits on a barrel. Yeah. And it's like no, <laughs> like, why would I ever want to do that? Yeah. They, they took control away from you. You no longer yeah, had to, yeah. you know. And I know like they did that because people don't understand, you know, the main, their mainstream audience isn't interested in like learning that you have to press A and hold the trigger to make make tell him you definitely want to climb that thing instead of just run past it. But I understood how that worked and I appreciated the level of control that the first yeah. you know, the Ezio games gave you. Um, and then Black Flag kind of brought it back because the pirate stuff I loved. Uh, really, the only problem I had with Black Flag was when they made me play Assassin's Creed. Yeah. <laughs> like every time they made me get off the boat, I'm like, oh, God. I gotta yeah. hide in another flower bed. Awesome. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Avatar. You think we're gonna see anything from Avatar at the show? Nope. I don't either. Um, when, didn't he just say that the movies aren't coming out till like 2020 or 2019, something? 2019. December 2019, I think, is currently Avatar 2's release date, unless he pushed that again. I so think it's 2019. Here's another case where they've announced a game way too early. Yeah. We talked about that as a topic we talked about last well, week. Well, to be fair, the, early the movie was the originally slated for this year. Right. And then it pushed to next year, and then they pushed it to 2019. I mean, this, this thing's coming out 10 years after the first movie at this point. And I wonder if anyone can... I mean, look, I know better than to bet against James Cameron at this point. Like, I didn't think Titanic was going to be a hit. Whoops. Yeah. I, I thought... <laughs> That's a I, big whoops. I saw Avatar... Yeah, I saw the 15-minute preview of Avatar with Leffler um, when you know, when they did that like IMAX sneak preview yeah. for, like, like six months before it came out. Yeah. We both came out being, oh my God, this movie's going to be terrible. Like, yeah. It was like the most <laughs> cliched nope. crap. Like, the, And it's like, well... No, but the, here's the thing about Avatar. Um, no one talks about it. Yeah. No one quotes it. No one refers to it. No one mentions, hey, let's watch Avatar. It was a theme park ride. It was like everybody went, put the 3D glasses on, rode through you know, Pandora Land, and forgot about it. I've actually watched it a ton of times because... I've and, never And part of that is it because again. it's one of like 10 3D Blu-rays that I have. Well, that's also part of the problem. And it's also the 3D Blu-ray is great. Yeah, like, but that's also part of the problem is for a long time, you could only get that, that Avatar 3D Blu-ray if you bought a particular brand of TV. Oh really? For a long time, it was that. exclusive. To, there was there was this thing where like you had like like a couple of companies like TV companies like would license you know hot 3D Blu-rays 
for their TV. So you had to like get it through a promotion through them. So for a long time, you couldn't just go out and buy a 3D Blu-ray of Avatar. And that, that ended a few years after that, but you know, because it's been so long. Um, but for a long time, like, that's why I never got it. In part because I hate Avatar, but also because, like, look, I'll watch something I don't particularly like as a demo of cool tech, which sure. I had a 3D TV and I was willing yeah. to do But I couldn't get it. it was, like, you were, you basically were, were, at the time, you were beholden to, um, like, like resellers who would get it through the promotion and then sell it for, like, 50 bucks. And I was like, I'm paying 50 bucks for 3D Blu-rays on, even on Amazon or on eBay, are crazy expensive, man. Oh, yeah, but this one was even more expensive because you had to go through, you know, you had to go through hoops to get it. Now yeah. you can just go buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like so, but that limit, but that limited crazy. the home, like kind of the home playback of that movie as kind of a cultural touchstone, and I think that's damaged it too. The question is going to become, whatever Cameron does with these sequels isn't going to be enough to get people interested again. And you know, I, I know, think it will. I know better than to think that Cameron won't. Be, but the other problem is he's shooting these things at sixty frames a second. Almost no theaters in the country can do that. Yeah, the to, projectors don't. They're even... going to have to pay like they did with Avatar, the first one. He's going to have to pay like major theaters in the country to change over and upgrade their technology to be able to run that. It was ultimately um, worth it. For but him, will it be this time? But not for, not for any movie after it. Like yeah. that's the thing is Avatar didn't change anything except everybody realized they could charge extra money for. Yeah, you know, it was like this is the same trick that they tried to pull with the Hobbit. Uh, yeah. High frame rate and 3D and all that stuff, and no one cared. Yeah. Because um, The Hobbit wasn't a very good movie. Well, that's the pro- that's the thing. <laughs> Hopefully, also, not that Avatar was mind blowing. Avatar was not a great but I movie, it. but Avatar showed you some tech on display that was like nothing we'd ever seen yeah. before. Yeah. It hasn't aged tremendously, but nothing ages well in 10 years in ter- in the terms of special effects no, on any of them, CG yeah. or no. Yeah. Um, well, maybe Star Wars. Yeah, those, I mean, those, those models it. still look pretty <laughs> yeah, good. They do, yeah. Um, but like CG progresses to the point that like you know it just ten years down the road it's just, you know and your eyes get trained. Yeah, you know what you're looking at. Your expectations are Hell, raised. Wa- even watch uh, watch uh, Iron Man one. Like some of that stuff. Oh, yeah. look, you know, Iron Man's suit doesn't look as good as it does. It now. literally it blew my mind the first yeah. time I watched it. Yeah. But like Avatar is going to have an uphill uphill battle, I think. Which if anyone can do it, it's James Cameron. But this game basically rides on the idea that that's going to happen. I don't remember how the first game sold. I mean, I vaguely remember the first game. I think it sold a million or two, something okay. like that. It's probably worth what they spent. It, it didn't sell probably proportional to the box office oh, that no. they would have hoped. No, 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 no. Definitely not. Um, and then, of course, you know, I mean, it could be a very lucrative deal because they're doing Avatar 2, 3, 4, and 5. I mean, don't forget that the game wasn't very good either. No, it I wasn't. I mean, that doesn't help. So. But neither was the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's um, true. But the movie had the tech. And I think Avatar, the first, Avatar game could be played in 3D, if I remember correctly. It, gee, I don't know, actually. I want to say that was a thing, but it was very, like, I mean, limited. Matt, if there's works. one thing that I've learned in What they should do is just make VR stuff out of it. Is that... People will go and see movies they know are terrible. And well, that's whole, Michael Bay's whole career. Yeah, exactly. But, and they will not buy and play video games that they know are terrible. And it, look, it, well, the movie's obviously, over in two hours. The movie's <laughs> over in two hours. It's cheaper. Um, Although but, it's getting there. But even when like a crappy game drops down in price, it's not like all of a sudden people buy it. Like people just don't want to experience it at all. Mm. And I see people on Facebook like every Saturday morning or what or whatever morning after a big movie premiere. I've seen trailers for this movie. I'm like that movie looks freaking terrible. Baywatch, that type of stuff. It's like I would never spend 15 to 20 dollars to go see these movies. And there are just so many people on my friends list that come back to like Oh my god, I went to see Baywatch. It was freaking terrible. It's like Shocking. no It's like no crap, dude. You do this every Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. You come on Facebook and say, "I can't believe this movie that looked terrible was terrible." Like it blows my mind. Like you want to know someone who does this and I think he may do it just because he likes punishment, Marcus Beer. He <laughs> he goes and sees the worst movies, man. That's like true. week after week after week, and he's he's one of those people that comes out and says, "I can't believe how arsing terrible that." It's like, yeah, dude, call me before you go next how time. Amazing. I'll the tell you, Alien Marcus, Covenant was disappointing. Right, oh, wow. Marcus, that movie is going to be terrible. Don't go see it. He would still go. Like he's got to know for know for himself. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I do that too with some some stuff. Um, yeah. And luckily, we apparently we don't seem to have that problem this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Because Wonder Woman's pretty freaking good. Did you go see it already? No, I'm seeing it tonight. But everybody I know who came back from it uh, last night was like, it's it's great. Yeah, I, the social media. In fact, I, in fact, yeah. I had a, I had a couple people I know who are just you know hate 
Man of Steel, hate Batman vs. Superman, hate Suicide Squad. Uh, and a couple of them came back and said, this one's not just, like, better than them. Like, he, they said, like, this is as good as, like, Iron Man 1. Yeah. Like, it, se- I, it sends you out of I've the theater, it it sends out of the theater media. Happy, happy and and with some hope for the DC movie. I mean, well, Justice League will bring us back down to the... Don't d- get your hopes up to too high, theater. Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Don't set yourself up for the fall. Oh, no. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, you know, what I'm being told over and over by people who I trust to know better or know for sure that, like... Yeah, I got sent out of theater feeling like I just seen a superhero movie that I wanted to see, which like, is like that's like a double home run like for for DC at this point. I can only think of one movie from the last like decade that I thought was going to be terrible and actually ended up being good, and that was Twenty One Jump Street. Yeah, usually I can just watch a trailer and be like, that movie's terrible, and it's terrible. But that was like the one movie that I like, actually was like really funny and yeah, good. Yeah, I'm trying so. to think of anything that surprised. I get um, Kingsman. Kingsman was better than I thought it would be. Although I don't think I don't think I thought it was gonna be terrible. I don't think I but knew I liked, hardly anything about it before I saw it. I saw it. the trailer, but I liked it. It was a good movie. I liked yeah. it a lot better than I expected to. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, Oblivion, the Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. I thought that looked terrible in trailers, and I eventually saw it on video, and I, and I really liked it. I thought it was really good. All right, let's That's move all I on. Got. <laughs> That's all I got. That's what I'm saying. They're few and far Usually I'm, I'm, pr- I'm pretty on target. Yeah. There have been a lot of stuff that's worse than I ever expected yeah, yeah. to be. <laughs> Absolutely. A lot of superhero Every movies Every Transformers anymore. movie. Every Transformers movie, yep. That's a, that's a good point. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about EA, or should we just call it Star Wars, the video game publisher at this point? Um, yeah. I think, you know, we It's all- amazing for such a large company how little output they really have yeah it really is but ea is swinging for the fences i mean yeah. everything it puts out ends up becoming a hit it is just on a run like we may have never seen from a third-party publisher before um the big questions obviously are the two star wars games mm-hmm. um star wars from motive studios and the star wars from v- visceral um st- the motive game you think we're even gonna get a glimpse of that i think we might get like a like the the three second clip like we got of visceral's game last year yeah uh, and for those of you who don't know, that's the one that uh, is being worked on by the brand new team. This is mm-hmm. not the one that's being worked on by Amy Hennig. Yeah, and Hennig is is uh, it's visceral. Yeah, right? and that's the that's the Han Solo. We think it's I think it's the Han Solo game. They showed what six seconds of it if last that, year or something barely. like that. I've been unable to dig that up. By the way, I've, I've wanted to look at it, and I don't think they ever put it out as like a separate uh, no, you'd, you'd, piece of they video. They didn't. You'd have to pull it from directly from the press conference. Yeah, that's the only time they showed it. But just a very brief glimpse. It looked good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For that brief, I mean, glimpse. I expect everything EA puts out to look good. Yeah, you know, they don't. You know, the, the Frostbite engine is solid. All their developers are just their image quality is is top notch at all times. Um, not worried about the graphics. Yeah. So Jade Raymond's game from Motive, probably nothing. Maybe just a quick glimpse and a logo, or maybe they tell you what it the, what it is, what the yeah. setting is, or something like that. Now I'll talk about the Visceral game, which we just mentioned. We got a quick look at it last year. You think we're getting a demo of it this year? No. No? Because I think that would show us too much. It's coming. I'm assuming it's coming Q4 next year. Um, that would be I my guess. I think it might be coming May next year. Really? To coincide Mid- with the movie. Oh, good point. Either coincide with the movie's release in May, which is the week before Memorial Day, or because um, Star Wars is moving back to its traditional right. release date next yeah. year. Uh, or you could do it in the fall and release it alongside the home video release. Uh, one or the other, I would think. Because I think that game is is tied in with the young Han Solo movie somehow. If it comes in May, though, we're going to see a demo at E3. Mm, at least a robust trailer. Mm. I don't know. That May time frame's tough. Because the thing you run into here is Lucasfilm controls what we see of these things, and they have not shown anything from the young Han Solo movie except, like, the cast shot. And if they don't want... You, us to see anything from that movie yet uh, we ain't gonna right. see a demo of that game you're absolutely right if that's what the game if is if that about. is in fact what it is i feel like it I, probably is. it's this it's the right time period from yeah. what we saw those four five seconds the character walking out of the doorway looked like it was the right build and right for a han solo type like i feel like i mean look if you've got amy hennig if you get the woman who created nathan drake who is basically han solo as indiana jones yeah like 
I feel like writing a young Han Solo like companion game is a no brainer there. Yeah. Um, I don't have the stars a- are aligning essentially. Yeah. I don't have any inside info on that at all. I just that's that really is my strong feeling that this is what her game is. Uh, maybe it's also just hope because I would love to see her write Han Solo. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, that's what I think, and I think uh, I just want to play a Star Wars are, game in that style. Yeah, well, I think the Star you. Wars games are going to be weird in in terms of our expected kind of rollout of them because Lucasfilm is going to control, you know, how that works because uh, the movies are Paramount. Um, well, the movies are Lucasfilm. Uh, Paramount's a different company, but like uh, the, the movies are just yeah, it's Paramount's all about that. Viacom. They will they will control what we see of those movies, and that includes any kind of tie-in content. So you know. Same with, uh, you know, there's clearly Last Jedi stuff in Battlefront 2. We are not going to see that. Yeah. In, in, you know, unless, except for like, you know, old Luke is, I think we've seen a, sh- a shot of his character model or is something Is he like in that. this trailer? I don't know if he's in the, ca- in the trailer, but I know he and, and Rey are playable as heroes in the game. I think. Matt, when was the last time we got an action adventure set in the Star Wars universe? Force Unleashed 2? Which was what? Yeah. 2010? Or 11? Was it later than that? I don't remember when the first one came out. It's been a long time. I would say the first one was 2008. When was the last time we got a good one? (laughs) Super Nintendo? (laughs) Mm, I mean, I'm being serious. I kind of liked Jedi Academy. Really? Liked it better than Jedi Outcast. I hate Jedi Outcast. Shadows um, of the Empire wasn't great. No. I mean, that's what I'm I, saying. I, I am hyped for like this the game. O- like, the only ones are, like, things I liked in spite of being kind of terrible, like Obi-Wan on the original Xbox. Yeah. Which I mainly... Oh, uh, Jedi Power Battles. I like that game. What? On the Dreamcast. <laughs> no one remembers that. But. What I'm saying, though, is it's a long time coming to get oh, yeah. a Star Wars action-adventure game of this quality. I am jacked like it's all been shooters and rpgs for ever as far as quality is concerned i am so excited to get to play a game like this uh set in the star wars universe especially knowing that amy hennig is at the helm so you know we're we're doing our e3 predictions and hype stuff next week um but i can say that this if this game appears in any form it will undoubtedly be one of the most exciting moments for me at E3. Mm. So I am I am jacked up. Star Wars Battlefront 2. Some of the cards... This will the... be the main focus. We'll be lucky yeah. to see anything from the Visceral game. I think. Yeah. They'll show boatloads of Battlefront 2. It's, they're doing 20 versus 20 multiplayer tournaments all the way through E3. Um, I have a feeling by the time we come out of E3, there won't be much left to the imagination for this game, which makes sense because it will then be coming out Four months later, it needs to start that big hype cycle for it. Mm -hmm. Um, What are your hopes for any sort of single-player content in this? Some. (laughs) I mean, 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 obviously there is there is the campaign and all that. Yeah. Um, I just. You think it's gonna be good though? I think so. I think be okay. Yeah. I mean, I like the story they're after, uh, and I always like playing as the Empire stuff. I just, you know, dice. it's, It's history with campaigns is not. I th- no, I thought the campaign was like being handled somewhat by Jade Raymond's people. Uh, I think they're doing like consulting on it, maybe. Yeah. I mean, how much? Look, Jade just came on, really. Mm-hmm. How much is she going to be able to change? I I don't know. I mean, my hopes are not high for the campaign. I guess is the best way to put it. I don't. Know, I like the premise. I don't think we know enough about you know what they're going to do beyond that. I just hope it's more robust than what we got in Battlefield One because I think Battlefield One was about half. <laughs> the amount of content I'd like. And, and look, get... it was miles better oh, than sure. the last three Battlefield campaigns, yeah, yeah. and it still wasn't great. I'm hoping for maybe something at least on the, on the, on the lines of Battlefield Bad Company 2, yeah. which is probably the best campaign they ever did. Yeah. Which still was Oh, definitely the best amazing. campaign. Yeah. But uh, just, it had moments and had character, and, and I miss... It's a testament what, to what a good writer yeah, can I do. I miss this yeah. guy. I still think... Uh, one of, my, one of my favorite Battlefield moments of all time is still when when they're trying to get get the the sa- satellite and the satellite crashes over them like like burns up over them and crashes and the one like the demolitions guy goes that is the greatest thing I have ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like yeah it's it's great. There's it's- lots of good moments in that game. 
Um, but so, that so shows you what like a good writer can do. Like, I would hope that someone outside <clears throat> of DICE could come to them at some point and be like, hey, remember Bad Company? You were on to something. Yeah. Like, let's apply that to this sort of idea. But I think, yeah, I like what we've seen in, uh, from the trailer and, like, kind of the, the premise of the, of the campaign. So I hope... Uh, I hope we see something cool. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot to make me happy with a Battlefront campaign, especially at, like the most robust one they've had before. That was Battlefront 2, where you played as like the stormtroopers going through the Clone Wars, and then the original trilogy. It was just sort of like couched in like sort of the 501st idea, and you know, it's all you need. It's, I mean, it's, the, the, game looks, mode. the game looks ridiculous visually. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. the first Battlefront blew us away, but this one, I think, even ups the ante even more. Yeah, well, they're, so. they're really pushing the scale on this one. Yeah, like the. What we've already seen, and I hope they uh, maybe they have a little VR component in there somewhere because I thought the the one in Battlefront One was great. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Uh, let's move on to more I think EA. That, I think that may have been paid in, for entirely by Rogue One's marketing budget, though. So I don't. Yeah. I wonder if EA is even interested in doing that for you know non outside money if they're willing to spend their own money on something like that. I guess we'll see. Another advantage of doing our show on Friday today: Need for Speed Payback was announced. Put out the first trailer for it. It actually takes place in the daylight. It's oh, not wow. all set at dark, although it does have nighttime settings as well. Uh, coming out November 10th for PC, PS4, Xbox One. Um, it looks to be story driven, yeah, which worked, is not that works so well. Bode for well before. for it if you go on past games. Although I will say it looks like the FMV stuff from last from the last game is gone. Mm. Um, all the cinemas look to be either pre-rendered CG or in-engine stuff. It's like at this point, just go get the Fast and the Furious license. That's clearly what they're trying to make here. Yeah, but it's Need for Speed. Like I think EA would argue that its license is just as powerful, at least in the video game. And they would lose that spectrum. argument. Yeah, <laughs> because Fast and the Furious made a billion and point six yeah. dollars, and this. Didn't. No, it didn't even come close. The last game completely flopped. I was actually surprised that they were putting out another one so quickly. Uh, you it's funny also... how they will not let Need for Speed go, but we haven't seen Wing Commander since the 90s. I can kind of understand that, though. Hey, and, 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 like, throw more stuff at the wall. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what EA does anymore, man. It just pumps Except out Except with this game. Yeah. Like, they, they will not let this die. At least make let somebody make a Burnout game again. Yeah. Well, the Burnout guys left, and they just put out Danger Zone, Zone, which is reviewing okay. Um, Do you care about Need for Speed Payback? No. No? Not at all? Not unless it gets good reviews. Yeah, but I mean, just looking at the changes that they've made from the last game. The last game, every time I looked at it, it looked like the same, because it was Mm. always at night, and it was like... You could never see anything, and it was... I look at that trailer, and I just have bad flashbacks to the run. Yeah. Like, I mean, it looks better than the run, just in the sense that it's not quite so crazy up its own bro ass about things. But like, <laughs> the last one was this, uh, with this the just, FMV oh, stuff, yeah. the, full, and this the live just, action. But this just absolutely looks like we're going to make uh, Fast and the Furious without the Fast and the Furious license. Like, where's the bald Vin Diesel look alike at this point? Yeah. Look, I mean, there's, there's his car. You're right, that was his it's car. Like, <laughs> You know, and that guy looks just like Paul Walker. I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's it, I mean, if people play it and say, "Hey, this is actually good," like I'll try it. But like, I'm pretty content to ignore this. Like every the last three Need for Speeds. Yeah, yeah. The series has been on a bit of a rough run here. Um, they even did the the, yeah. Vin, the you know the the. The, the wheelie thing there, like like Vin Diesel's character always does. I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, you can see what they're doing. I know what you're doing. It would be dumb not to, though. I mean, it's like you said. Look how much money the film made. Yeah. It's just... Mm. Like, I find... I don't know. I'm a fan of the Fast and the Furious movies, like, against all odds. I think they're the dumbest fun you can have yeah. at action movies. It's, they're it's, one of those movies that you can turn on at any point in the movie, and you watch the rest of it, typically. Yeah. yeah. I, I get that. They're not smart or anything like that. They're dumb fun. Yeah. And sometimes that's what you want from but films. But they're also so. really character-driven in, yeah. in a weird way. And, yeah. like, you get attached to these people. There's a continuity everybody, across everybody them. Everybody feels like they're having a great time making the movie. It's a, They're good. And, like... They're just... Here's one thing I'll say about those movies, though. They're just, like, comedies. Like, they seem to be yeah. pretty good until they have to resolve everything. Oh, yeah. The third act is always... It just can be awkward. A joke. Like, you might as well just cut it off. Like, the last one I watched, like, they all are sitting at, like, a picnic table having, like, lunch or something. And I'm like, what the hell is going on Family. (laughs) 
That's what they say There's over and over. Family. In that scene. Like, they say it like Somebody made a graph times. of how many times they say family in, in each movie in the series. And, like, once you hit five, it goes, like, up here. And it becomes, it just never drops again. Um, it's so funny. We, had, when we, we watched, uh, a bunch of us watched uh, the whole series before eight, came, like, yeah. week eight came out as, like, a marathon thing. Because a bunch uh-huh. of people hadn't seen it. And that was one of the drinking game things. I was going to say, that would be a really good drinking family, game. And once you hit five through seven, it's just like, we're all going to die. Like, we're not going to make it through this. Because they keep talking about family. Family. Call the ambulance. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm lukewarm on Need for Speed. It looks more interesting than the last one, the one that they didn't even bother giving like a subtitle to. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. That generally, you do that when you reboot something. I'm just more. Not the total failure of a reboot. I just don't think it speaks to either of our preferences for Need for Speed, and I prefer kind of the old style '90s PlayStation One Hot Pursuit sort of straight up. Give me an amazing track design and give me some cops. It does appear to have cop chases. Yeah, but they all have that. I mean, I, I, I just want that kind of that that curated, you know, concentrated track design oriented experience. And you're more of the underground fan who wants like the the tuning and the and the kind of the, the trappings of the world. And I feel like you're not getting either of those things in this game. All right, let's move on. Uh, we're not going to talk a long time about the sports suite from EA uh, Madden NFL 18, obviously going to be shown off for the first time um rumors have been sworn not even rumors it's in this teaser trailer uh, it appears that there's going to be a campaign mode in madden for the first time mm. that has me extremely excited uh for the first time in a madden game in forever um i'm really Sam's pumped about that this footage yeah <laughs> he'll just keep <laughs> looping this over and over again thank god this doesn't have like brady holding up the lombardi trophy <laughs> that's all we see um I'm really excited for Madden. I haven't said that in a really, really long time. In fact, at this level that I'm excited, I probably haven't been this pumped since it went from like 2D to 3D. So I'm really excited for that. Having played FIFA and seeing how they did their campaign mm. um, and being pretty impressed with that. So I'm definitely excited for Madden this year, um, which is a bump for EA that it normally doesn't get with me. Uh, FIFA is FIFA. I'm kind of excited to see the Switch version of FIFA because they're saying it's a completely different game from the other versions of FIFA, um, which is rare. Um, Michael Pachter did his E3 predictions for, on this week's episode. I don't know if you watched it or not, but one of his predictions was there will not be a single, not one, Western third-party game announced for Switch at E3. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's that crazy. Like, no, I don't think it's crazy at all. Yeah, I think that could actually be pretty accurate. Everyone's kind of sitting back and waiting to see if this thing... You know, that's the thing. You'll get third-party Western stuff on... Because you have to make a Switch version. Of, it's not like just porting it. Right. You have to make a special version. Yep. It's like the Wii. You will see Western devs start to support that if the Switch hits critical mass in terms of units sold. Maybe that's next it. year. Maybe next year's E3 we start to see some of that. So there's a whole lot... Of, and then like the two <clears> schools <throat> of thought on that are going to go back and forth until we finally see you know, the, you know, what Nintendo's stepping up to say that you know, guaranteed production of 20 million units or something. By the, yeah, by, 18 I think it was. Yeah. And like... There's some people who are like, oh, wow, it's going to sell it immediately. And some people are like, who knows if they're even going to sell that many in the whole the system's whole lifetime. That's a lot. And uh, it is a lot. But you know, just the fact that it sold real fast out of 2 million out of the gate doesn't mean you're going to get to 18. Yeah. So it's going to be... It's going to be a spectator sport, I guess, <laughs> to see what I, And FIFA, I mean, the thing about FIFA is like, I'm interested, kind of interested to see what they do with it on the Switch because... The FIFA experience as it exists today is so heavily tied in with online that, like, the Switch... I don't think the Switch has the infrastructure to do that. At least not yet, until they launch this thing next year. You know, we'll see how that works. But it's like, I feel like if that's the FIFA experience you want, you're going to automatically default to one of the main, main, bigger console, the powerful consoles with, you know, the robust online services. Yeah, I don't so see Switches, professional FIFA players jumping no. over to the Switch. So, <laughs> even though they, there's a lot of photos of the teams, like, holding, right. holding them because yeah. they got sent them yeah. by Nintendo. But, like, um, the, you know, the Switch version is going to have to have something to it that makes it really unique, that makes you want to have it in addition to FIFA 18, yeah. not ju- not instead of. Well, there is a certain point where a console starts to mature and you need to satisfy your existing consumer base while also thinking about bringing in new people. But you're right. This is the period right now where Nintendo needs to be bringing in new people. And that's why I'm wondering, you know, they are creating a separate version just for Switch, and I'm curious to see what EA does. Because EA has been this publisher that supported Switch out of the gate. It supported the Wii U out of the gate. It tep- it typically dips its toe in the waters mm-hmm. with Nintendo and if it doesn't do well with those first couple games, it's out. Oh yeah. Well, this is like kind of the thing where 
Uh, I keep thinking of um, it's a show called Greg the Bunny. You Never watched it. it. No. It's Sarah Silverman and a bunch of people, but it, but it was basically about a kids show, and uh, the puppets in it were real. You know, they're played like Roger Rabbit, like they're real people that are actors on the show. So it's basically about it's like Thirty Rock, but with like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and the puppets are like actors. And at some point, Seth Green, who's the son of the executive producer, gets a chance to re- it, it revamp the show. The, re- the show's called, I think, Sweetwater Junction. And he revamps it into something for today's kids. And it's called, like, like SJ2K and stuff. And, like, <laughs> now the train flies on, like, hovered jets. And everybody's, right. like, in space and stuff. And it's ridiculous. And they sit down for, a, like, a focus test thing. Sarah Silverman plays the, the network exec rep- like liaison. And she's like, I just want to say to Seth Green, like, I just want to say, you know, we love the show. We love the concept. It's amazing. It's going to be fantastic. We, we, we love it. Everybody at, at, at the network loves it. Da, da, da. And, he said, and then Seth Green says, well, then why are we having this, this focus test? And she says, to see if we like it. <laughs> and like, that is what EA is doing. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll finish on that right there. Uh, let's move on. We're going to talk about BioWare's project that's been floating out there. Mm-hmm. Teaser trailers have been out there for a while. Um, you think we'll get a look at that? Yes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, and this is like an always online connected game, Something, open I world. Know. I know a couple people who are actually working on it, and they won't tell me anything about it. Yeah. But it seems... For seem- good reason. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems like uh, everyone seems to expect it's going to be shown. Yeah. Finally. That's exciting. Um, everyone who is down on Mass Effect and Drama, here comes a real McCoy. Here yeah, comes, here comes Edmonton. Here comes the real studio. So uh, straight out of the icy north. Do you think that this will be like the finisher of the press conference for EA? Um, it could be. Uh, I think it depends how much wow. So the Star Wars stuff they, they have the show. Um, <laughs> it would be a good way to lead off the press conference, maybe. Yeah, you either lead off with it or you close with it. I think it depends what kind of how how impactful ea feels their star wars stuff is yeah like or how, and how much they have how much show. they have like if you actually have something to show of the visceral game if you're being allowed by lucasfilm to like kind of debut some of that like maybe you save that till the end yeah um but yeah i could see them closing with the bioware new ip and make a big splash uh last game that ea has announced officially that we already know about is ea sports ufc 3 um you know what you're getting with that game yeah um it's a mavis beacon teaches punching Yep. <laughs> so, I wonder like, if they get like uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr. in there this year with uh, all the talk about him fighting against uh, Conor McGregor. Mm. That seems like an expensive license. It is, but that's how you turn like a ho hum game into a smash hit. I mean, True. if you remember, think back to EA's like boxing games, like when they would kind of have stunt people come right. in and be a part of those. That would be an interesting way to kind of like move forward. Kind they have Bruce forward. Lee and like that's their boxing games. So this is, seems like something that might happen for UFC. They bring him in. Um, that would be the biggest fight in the history of fighting, by the way, Conor McGregor, when if he fights Floyd Mayweather. Who do you, who do you think wins it? If it's just boxing. If it's just boxing, I'm going to go Mayweather. Boxing. Yeah. If, yeah. If he can kick the guy in the shins, maybe the... Yeah, I think it's just is. boxing. And, uh, yeah, you probably have to go with Floyd Mayweather. You just can't hit Floyd Mayweather. He, I don't think he'll knock, knock Conor McGregor out. No. Because he never punches. He just dodges and just counter punches. So, I hate watching Floyd Mayweather fights, by the way. <laughs> They're the most boring thing I've ever watched. Uh, but there's no denying he has the best defense of any boxer I've ever watched. I just wish he had more offense. So... All right, that does it for EA. Now it's time to move it on to Nintendo. I know you guys have been probably been looking up for that graphic going, man, when are you going to switch it up and start talking about Nintendo? We're doing it right now. Um, I'm going to lead it right off with the big boy, the biggest boy of all. The game Nintendo has said it already that it is focusing most of its E3 attention on, Super Mario Odyssey. Do you anticipate like this being like it was with Zelda last year where like the whole booth has just become the Mushroom Kingdom and... It's I would, all I would about so. Mario. I think they'll have more than just this, but I would expect like at least half to two thirds of the booth will be that. Do you think that's the right move when you have a new console fresh out the box? Um, maybe not uh, from like a kind of a marketing standpoint. But in I terms still can't of, believe this game, by the way. In terms of just like, <laughs> it still just blows my mind. <laughs> in terms of just like visual 
punch. Like, I don't think you can argue that last year's booth was anything but the best looking thing on the floor. Oh, yeah. It um, wasn't even close. I mean, it was just like it was a whole other league. I mean, it was, I mean, it, I've been to 17 of these things, and that's one of the most impressive displays I've ever seen yeah. from anyone ever. Nintendo did it right without a doubt. Um, and so I think if you can do that same thing with the worlds of this game, with like the Mushroom Kingdom, or maybe even just, like, maybe even. Maybe not New Donk City. I don't need to. Yeah. Be, I don't need to wait in line for three hours. We can to just see walk New Donk outside City. onto the street and see that. Right. Um, <laughs> but you can, if you can do that, like maybe make this world, like you make make that in like full full scale in the booth, like that's. I mean, everyone's gonna want to take their picture there. I think my eyeballs may pop out of my head if that were the case. I like mean, a, look, like Mario's... this like flying hat thing is probably gonna be like the top of the booth, and so you know, I, I I feel like there's a like, like the diversity of of environments in this game is way bigger than anything we've ever seen in a 3d mario yeah and, and in that way i agree with you i think they have the capability to create something special like they did with zelda i think if it was just a oh, mush, please the give mushroom out, uh, pimp bowser uh <laughs> plush dolls i think if it was just the mushroom kingdom it would just come off as kind of garish um but i think with the way that this game from what they've shown in this game so far I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. you could have a really amazing booth built. You have to do like a, a variety of it, or you could just like pick, you know, like they did with Zelda. They picked one air, one, you know, environment and just did that up, like a, you know, the magic forest kind of look. Even though we know now Zelda has no, like many, many different bi biomes in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you, t you know, I'm sure they know what they think would be the best thing, maybe you know, to do a, a booth from and you know, really do it up and uh, you know, just, you know. I think Zelda just was, you know, Zelda's booth last year was a, you know, a home run, especially when you consider that for most companies, only having one game to show should be a detriment. Yeah. But they turned it into the big, the best, their strength. Yeah. And I think they hit on something there, and I, I, I no, would I like agree. to see them keep going. I think Maybe Nintendo... they don't have to do it every year from now on, but when it comes to, like, their big guys, when it comes to, like, Zelda and Mario, like, give Mario that treatment, too, I, I say. I feel like N N you're right. I think Nintendo kind of uncovered a secret nut last year mm -hmm. where they were like, wait a minute, all these years we've been so concerned with having every game in there and making sure we have four kiosks of this and five kiosks of that. Nintendo figured out that Single games move hardware. Mm -hmm. And if there's one game that's big enough and gets enough hype and gets enough of the press behind it, it can be a game changer. Mm -hmm. And I think other publishers would probably do well to kind of learn from that strategy. Instead of trying, like, you know, we go to E3 and you have an appointment with Sega or whoever. And you go there and they kind of jump you around and try to show you every game in that 15 or 20 minute appointment period that you have. Wouldn't it be just far more effective for them to just say, hey, here's 30 minutes with our best freaking game? Instead yeah. of trying to, like, waste your time. Because they take you to everything. Even games that they know aren't great. I remember PR people going like, well, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to show you this game. That happened a lot in the Sega. Yeah, it happens, it happens a lot <laughs> everywhere. Because every publisher has kind of off games that aren't their marquee games. And I think Nintendo mm. figured it out. They're like, people don't want to see the next crappy Sonic game. No disrespect. At our booth, they want to see Mario. They want to see Zelda. They want to see Metroid this year. Damn it! Yeah. Well, <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Um, um, you get one little corner. Yeah. A little, <laughs> a little, a little shoebox diorama of Bryn Star. That'll be your your Metroid booth. Uh, how excited are you for Super Mario Odyssey? Moderately. I mean, I'm not a big Mario fan overall, but I like the 3D ones better. And uh, at this point, I love Mario Odyssey just because New Donk City bothers you so much. It does. So. <laughs> it really does bother me a lot. The rest of the game I have no problem with. It's just that city environment. I just can't. It just doesn't make any sense. Look at that. That makes no sense. I mean, I get, I mean, it, yes, it it's, has massive Sonic Adventure flashbacks. It does. Um, which is not good for anyone. No. But, like... Look, the rest of I'm, it, I I'm, a, I'm a giant Nintendo skeptic, but I have a lot more faith in Nintendo for pulling that off than Sega. Yeah, I would agree. I guess I would agree with that. Um, look, I'm still jacked up over this game. I am one of the world's, I don't know the world's biggest, but 3D Mario games are one of there, my there favorite There are bigger Mario games. fans out there. Uh, yeah. I, I realize. I went to say that. <laughs> you banned a few of them. I yeah, I've banned a few. <laughs> I've worked with a couple. Yeah. I worked with Mike Damiani. He he is probably the biggest Nintendo fan I've ever known in my yeah. life. Um, but I love these games. And what I love about this game is that it's free roaming. I loved Super Mario 3D World on the Wii U. 
but it to me it can't even scratch the surface of what you get from a free uh, free roaming 3D platformer Mario. Um, yeah, these was, are my. I mean, to me, 2D Mario's peaked with the uh, Mario World on the Super Nintendo. Yeah. Nothing, nothing I've ever played since then has been as good as that, yep. except the 3D stuff. And the yep. 3D stuff with a short stop off into the Mario Sunshine territory. Bleh. Yeah. Um, I still like, like Sunshine, but eh. Like I, I still like 64. I still love Galaxy One and Two. Like those are great games. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I hope this one lives up to that, that legacy. I mean, it feels. It feels like they're in that same kind of creative groove that Galaxy had. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. Know? It looks crazy. <laughs> Where Galaxy was crazy so good much, though sometimes. So much thinking outside the box and kind of reinventing what a, what a 3D platformer could be in a way that wasn't annoying and wasn't hard to learn. It was just there, and it just you saw things and they just made sense, and then you played them and it was fun. Yep. And like that's what Nintendo is at its best. Agreed. Uh, let's talk next about Fire Emblem Warriors. Uh, there's been information coming out about that over the last week. Some screenshots, some character profiles. Uh, it's basically just Dynasty Warriors set in the Fire Emblem universe. Mm. Um, how excited are you for that? I'm pretty excited. I mean, I liked Hyrule Warriors quite a bit. Um, and as a matter of fact, I bought uh, Dynasty Warriors 8 Empires for like 9 bucks on PlayStation Network a couple weeks ago. And like, it didn't play nearly as well as Hyrule Warriors does. Um, Interesting. Like Hyrule Warriors is a much more so- felt much more solid, felt much more responsive and meaty when hitting guys and stuff. Um, very satisfying in a way that Dynasty Warriors Eight wasn't. And I'm not a you know Muso game expert by any means, but like I just was imp- I was surprised by how much better the Nintendo license tie-in felt than the was it the game. license or was it the way the game felt? It was the way played. the game felt. Like Hyrule Warriors felt better to play. Like, not just, you know, strip all the Zelda stuff out of it. It still felt better to play than Dynasty Warriors. I'm wondering if that might be because they brought in Team Ninja for some some punch-up because of that license. That could be. But if they follow in the footsteps of Hyrule Warriors but do it with Fire Emblem, I mean, I like Fire Emblem's character designs a lot. In fact, they're one of the only Amiibos I buy automatically just because I like how they look. So you give me that universe and those characters like in a in a realm where I can actually run around and actually fight guys like that. I think that's great. Like I'm I'm in. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of Muso games. Neither am I. Really, I haven't played. I mean, Hyrule Warriors was the first one I think I played since Dynasty Warriors six. Yeah. Maybe earlier years. I mean, been years. And well, I was what like, I tend to do is I tend to play unless I have to play it for review. I tend to play a couple levels and I'm like. Got it. I got it. I'm yep, good. Yep. I mean, how many how many times in my life have I played the Yellow Turban Rebellion? Yeah, like forty. Like I mean, it it, it gets up there. Yeah. But I mean, you you, you I mean, I've never played an action Fire Emblem game, so I'm on board. Like I'll buy that when it comes out. I'm wondering how well it's gonna do. I was skeptical about Hyrule Warriors. Hyrule Warriors. I waited till it was 1999, uh, like on the sale at Target, to get it. And then after I played it, I realized like you know what. I would have paid full price for this if I'd known how much I liked Interesting. it. Interesting. I feel like these games are mostly character driven. Like you either have mm-hmm. to like the characters or you, or you don't. And I think yeah. that's why I think Hyrule Warriors did pretty well. Um, I, I just feel like the Fire Emblem characters. I agree with you. I like them as well, but they're very nondescript and kind of generic fantasy characters. Mm. Um, watching that, if someone told you it was a Fire Emblem game or didn't tell you it was a Fire Emblem game and you watched it. I don't know if most people would know it's a Fire Emblem. I mean, I wouldn't know because they have a. They, to me, they have a distinct look to their armor and stuff like that. That looks like Fire Emblem to me. Really? Yeah, but um, I don't know if it's going to be a giant hit, but it's gonna it's gonna be in my Switch. I don't think they need to have every every game doesn't have to be a giant hit. It's no. like I said earlier, it's something to play. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like at a certain point, you have to say, okay, we're satisfying the people who have bought our console to make mm-hmm. sure that they stay engaged with it. And keep buying more games. And I'm always up for more Fire Emblem content, pretty much whatever it is. Yeah. I like that series. I mean, you go back to, like, FIFA for Switch. It's like, it's another one of those games you're trying to satisfy the people who have bought it already. But it also is a little bit of a novelty in that it's mm-hmm. the only handheld version of FIFA. I mean, you can take FIFA on the go and play it with you. So, um, you know, with every Switch game, you have sort of that unique selling proposition. Especially now that we're probably seeing the Vita being sent out to pasture here soon. Um, I doubt we'll see it covered at all or, or in any way, shape, or form at E3. And Sony's not going to sort of address it at all, I guess. So, mm-hmm. well, the last year they did a little bit. Yeah. After not doing it the year before. <laughs> <laughs> so, with Vita going out, <coughs> I mean, 
Switch is kind of the only yeah. game in town right now to play console I'm quality. I'm to see if they, if they talk about it. I mean, the Vita was surprisingly prevalent last year. Yeah. Like, they Just were holding nowhere. it like, Here it is. Don't forget. Remember? Like, like, even yeah, though we, yeah, that. <laughs> don't forget about this, even though we forgot. I have one of those somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I honestly don't even know where mine is right now. I, I think I know where mine is, but I don't know where the charger is. Every year I keep, or every month, I keep claiming the free games. Yeah, same. And it's so funny. Yeah. Every time I claim one for the Vita, I think to myself, I go to this mental image of me sitting on a plane playing my Vita. I don't know why. I don't hardly fly at all anymore. Well, that was like one of the only and places I've played it. And when I do, I, I take my 3DS, and a lot of times I take my 3DS and don't even use it. I end up for watching a movie. For literally years, I took both the Vita and the 3DS, and after like two years of, of doing that, I realized like, I've never taken the Vita and out ever. It, yeah. So I'm just not going to carry Oh, I'm carrying extra weight. Well, I think a big thing with the Vita for me, and we're totally on a tangent as usual on this show, but I think the Vita for me is that I always assume that I'm going to get in the middle of something and it's going to die. Yeah, that's, that's not unreasonable. Because this battery is terrible. And its games are a lot... Of, most of them are like console games where they're yeah. not like these little bite-sized things that you can play a little bit and put it away or whatever. I, so. just, I just find it uncomfortable yeah. to hold for a long time. Yeah. I don't, I don't find the 3DS to be uncomfortable. How many Vitas did they end up selling in the U.S.? I don't know. I have not. I don't, I don't know if I've remember. ever seen that number. I know it's done really if well If I have, I don't remember what it is. It's done really well in Japan. They have like a million different colors there and we still have one. Yeah, if that. <laughs> if that. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen one. It's in like a store the original. Oh, you mean one alternate color? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen a Vita in a store. And where do you even buy them on Amazon? I guess. Yeah, I guess. I, you're right though. They don't, in, like, <laughs> yeah. they don't have them in like Best Headquarters. They don't have them in like Best Buy and like I don't see them. I guess not. I mean, I would never occur to me to look. Yeah. <laughs> Which is maybe half the problem. Yep. All right, let's move on. Uh, very quickly, talk about uh, Fire Emblem for the Switch, which is the legit strategy Actual, RPG yeah. uh, game for the Switch. There's no footage or anything of that out there yet. And they, they don't know when. Is that next year or this year? Uh, the Eurogamer just did a great interview with sort of the Fire Emblem series Shepherd, And he talked about he's worked on the series for forever. And uh, he was all he was saying is the game looks like awesome. He's like it's the best looking Fire Emblem game ever, and he was just kind of jacked up to see these characters that he's been working on for all this time finally in glorious 3D. Uh, but he didn't offer much beyond that. It's it's not supposed to come out this year, mm. um, but I think we should get the first look at maybe gameplay or something like that. Maybe yeah. I mean, uh, Fire Emblem Warriors is probably enough Fire plus Fire Emblem Echoes, which just came out, probably enough Fire Emblem for one year. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, and the mobile game. It's been a pretty good year for Fire Emblem. Oh, it has been the year of Fire Emblem. And then don't forget, you know, you had um, the Wii U game that came out just last year. Yeah. Tokyo Mirage Sessions, FE. <laughs> I mean, weird. that was essentially a Fire Emblem game. So, yeah, I mean, Nintendo's all over it. It's crazy how Fire Emblem has become this, like... Thing. Yeah, not bad for something that first showed up in Mar Smash Brothers Melee, and I was like, "Who the hell is Marth?" Marth yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's changed. I mean, Nintendo that is one case. That's the antithesis of how it's handled Metroid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's managed to take this obscure strategy RPG franchise and rise up with it, and then you have this other thing that everybody loves, and it's done nothing but just tamp it down into the dirt. I don't, know. I don't get it. Metro is down, down in the vault, hanging out with Advance Wars. Yeah. Uh, no More Heroes 3, I don't think we're going to hear or see anything no, about I, that. I didn't get the impression they even started that. Yeah, I think Suda51 said something like two weeks ago, and just basically saying he regrets like announcing <laughs> it. <laughs> this was all a mistake. Yeah, and he just regrets announcing it already, because now every time people see him, they're asking him about it. And they're like, well, what's up with No More Heroes 3? He's probably like, I haven't even done anything on that No, it's like, I'll see you in 2019 for a trailer if we're lucky. Yeah, I mean, they make, who knows, they may create some kind of CG trailer for it and, and it, run it. I mean, that's the advantage of They're doing... probably around the time where you would need to have some kind of proof of concept thing like that, so maybe they could show that. Yeah. I mean, that's the advantage of doing the Nintendo Directs, is you don't have to answer to anybody afterwards. Yeah. I mean, it used to be... Like, I remember <laughs> I interviewed Cammie Dunaway after her <laughs> disastrous press conference, and oh my god, Ooh. it was one of the most awkward... Is that the one of the snowboarding on the, on yep. the, Wii, U the yep. Wii balance board? It was one of the most awkward interviews I've ever done in my life. I have never been more shocked to talk to an executive at that high of a level at a company that knew so little about their products. I mean, she basically had a list of bullet points that she had memorized, and let mm. me tell you, as she memorized them, and she just stood there and smiled as big as she could 
and repeated those bullet points. And if I asked anything outside of those bullet points that she was prepared to talk about, she was like, we can't, we're not prepared to talk about that now. <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> Wow. It was so bad. I never interviewed her again. I mean, Reggie does the same thing, but you can tell, like, he knows stuff. That yeah. Is, or the whole, like, I, my favorite Reggie moment. Reggie has personality. Yeah, but also my favorite Reggie moment was probably, uh, I think it was this, the second year of the Wii, and Keeley was like, like, he's like, did the first, like, oh, okay, congratulations. Where are the games? Yeah. <laughs> and Reggie's like, we gave you Animal Crossing. And Jeff's like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Like, but Reg, see, that's the thing. Reggie with, sat there and feigned ignorance yeah. about what Jeff was talking about for like five minutes, and it was amazing. That's the thing with the, the directs, though, is that you can do this big presentation, and you don't have to go out and talk right. to a Jeff Keeley or a Shane Satterfield afterwards. You just do it, and you're like, Psh, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> Let's go do our treehouse streams. Yep. Just sit, continue to sit in the hotel lobby with the, with the mimosas. Right, exactly. Um, so... It's possible that we see No More Heroes 3 in some kind of CG form, because they're never going to have to answer mm -hmm. questions about, well, how far along is it, and blah, blah, who's developing it, and blah, blah, blah. They yeah, Suda has to an has answer that right. when and that's why, him later. Right, and that's why he's now saying, I wish I had never done that, <laughs> in addition to how terrible he did during the presentation. So, uh, Pokemon Stars. Mm -hmm. The rumored Pokemon Sun and Moon port for Nintendo Switch. Long rumored. Yeah. Um... If you'd have talked to me two, two or three weeks ago, I would have said, I don't think we'll see it. But now that they just should, they just put out the first Japanese TV spot for Monster Hunter Double Cross, which is a 3DS game that's coming to the Switch, mm -hmm. um, it seems to be that sort of porting something from the 3DS over to the Switch isn't all that difficult. I wouldn't think so, yeah. So it's looking like we're probably going to get a look at that game. It would be... If they, if they are doing... A, you know, a third, you know, a platinum equivalent for the Sun and Moon series. It would be pretty stupid not to put it on both. Yep. I mean, it could instantly become the Switch's best-selling game. Mm -hmm. It could outsell Zelda, especially because, like, like, also because, like, you know, I think we we definitely noticed the technical shortcomings in the 3DS of Sun and Moon. Oh yeah. The 3DS felt like it was barely keeping up. Yep. And if you know, if and then you look at Zelda, and the Switch was barely keeping oh, yeah. up. Oh <laughs> yeah, and uh, but I think you know, if if you're still working off of the Sun and Moon, uh, you know, Sun and Moon basically same thing, but with like slightly different content. Uh, the Switch is going to run that way better. Yeah. So that would Absolutely. be the that would probably be the pref preferable version if you aren't afraid of a shorter battery life. It's like uh, that that uh, image, that meme of uh, Owada that's been going around, for, and Miyamoto has been going around forever, where they just are holding like the DS, or, mm -hmm. and the money's just flying it's out of it. printing money. I mean, yeah. that's really what you're going to do with uh, with Pokemon Sun and Moon on Switch. It, yeah. It'd be a sh it'd be, will be a shame to lose the second, the touchscreen uh, for the inventory. Yeah, uh, I didn't use it all that much. I, mean, I use it constantly. I love, I love that second screen for inventory in the Pokemon games, because otherwise you're navigating shit too much. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you know, you kind of balance between you know, you want inventory convenience or you want performance or, yep. and probably better visuals. I still would argue that I would have been totally fine if the Switch had the screen that worked on the TV just like the Wii U, like a TV and a handheld that worked at the same time. Yeah, but I think of course you couldn't call it Switch then because nothing's switching. But no, but the Wii U I think scared them off that concept. It the sure did. Concept for a while. <laughs> it did. Uh, Mario and Rap Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. That's a known quantity now. Mm. Um, it seems like one of those rumors that could have never been true. And yet. And yet, it absolutely is. We it, talked about that, this a little that earlier. That game all, I always thought was real. because How come? Because it's too weird to me. To not be? Like, like why like, would how anyone can someone make that, that up? up? You're right. Like, it's, it's too dumb <laughs> to not be real, basically. You're right, man. Um, but, like, you know, now that we know a little bit about it, it certainly, you know, out of the box, like, is, you know, wouldn't expect, like, what it is and, like, they're kind of messing with the with messing with Mario a little bit. They're they're playing around with it. They've got that one, and then the rabbits, of course, are just the rabbits. You've got and like I guess like Yoshi is like obsessed with heavy weaponry or something. Like like they've all got the kind of the, the roles they play. And like yeah. Yoshi's role is like he blows stuff up. Like he fire. He, like he's got a rocket launcher and stuff. I'm like oh, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Which makes me think maybe it's not real, because <laughs> that just seems completely out of character. I mean, that and, is the best fake I've ever seen. And off IP. I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe they've all got guns. I, I mean, guess like, 
<laughs> hey, Nintendo's getting Super brave odd. in its old age. I don't get it. And like, um, like the one rabbit's dressed like kind of like peach and like yeah. kind of in drag and yeah. like taking selfies all the time. I mean, it's so weird. I honestly have no and interest guess, in this game whatsoever. And it's all a, turn, it's all turn-based strategy, like yeah. RPG kind of thing. And like, I guess in the overworld stuff, you don't even control the characters. You control some like disc, kind of flying disc thing that leads them places. Like, so odd. Like, I have no I interest in that game at all. I'm interested None. to just see more about. I want to see it in motion because I'm like I'm. I mean, I don't know if I'll play it, but I'm sure curious to see how they present well, it. Well, I'm sure I'll watch the trailer. Right. <laughs> but I'm just curious to see how they sell this thing to us. You know, like how do you introduce that? That's another case where they show this and they don't have to answer questions half the <laughs> <laughs> And they're very happy about that. Uh, Splatoon 2, we've talked about that a ton. Yeah, no brainer. No brainer. Uh, they're doing a big tournament at the show. We mentioned that already. Um, Going to be a big push for them. Coming not too far after E3. Uh, did you ever get in on the, the beta? Did you ever have time to go and play it? No. No? I, I didn't play the ARMS thing. That's what we're talking about next. ARMS. Game comes out during E3. Mm. Um, I have not got it yet. Some of the press have got the game. I have not got it yet, so I haven't really had a chance to play. I do know that the Global Test Punch happens again tomorrow, if you want to check it out. Mm -hmm. I know you're kind of down on the game, but if you want to check it out, it happens tomorrow. Well, I think it's like just, 10 in the morning. Maybe. like The times have not been convenient. Yeah, for, they for haven't Pacific. been. And I think there's three more sessions left. There's one tomorrow morning. One tomorrow evening, and maybe one on Sunday or Monday. There's one They're... on Sunday, like Sunday morning. Like most of, like a bunch of them are like four in the morning here, and like three in the. I mean, it's yeah. It's, I'm it... going to play it tomorrow because I'm going out drinking to watch a Penguins game tomorrow night, and I know I'm not getting up early on Sunday to play it. I'm so. going to try, but it's like so far, like none of the times have worked. Yeah, so I'm going to give it a whirl tomorrow. Um, again, it also has a big esports tournament. Um, a lot of the previews and the impressions of it have been pretty freaking positive. That have come out over the last few days as the press have been playing the final version. Uh, YouTube channel Game Explain put up like an hour of gameplay from the final retail version. Um, and it seems to be really hyped about it. We'll see. Um, mm -hmm. So far, most people seem to be digging it pretty much. And I have a feeling it's going to be a pretty big focus at E3 as well. Uh, Pikmin 4. Miyamoto has said that game has been done, finished for a long time. Uh... I know I've called for this before from Nintendo, mm -hmm. and it hasn't happened. It just I can't understand why why it's waiting so long. Yeah. Unless you, you called it for last year's E3, and then you called it for their direct in January. And right, and it, I keep getting burned. Third third time's a charm. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I don't. Maybe they're completely reworking the game. That's the only way I, I can maybe. figure. You think this or Metroid more likely? Well. We'll get into our E3 predictions next episode. We'll do a whole <laughs> segment of E3 predictions. So I don't want to get into that too much. But I don't look at like saying Pikmin 4 is going to be there as like a prediction. Like it just should be. Mm. It's, as Miyamoto has said, on the record, it's complete. It has been done for a while. It, is, it just didn't want to release it on Wii U. So it needs software for its new platform. I would be really shocked if it isn't shown in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I'd be really excited about it. I love Pikmin. And I've been a big fan. Love to see what it, what they'll do with it. I wonder about playing it on the little screen in mm. handheld mode. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if maybe that might be some of the holdup for why we haven't seen it yet. If maybe Nintendo's trying to figure out a way to make it work on the small screen in handheld mode. Um, I tried to play. I remember I played Pikmin 3 on the Wii U gamepad and it was a problem. Yeah, they're not easy to see on the Well, the other screen. thing, too, is that the Wii U gamepads, the screen's resolution, it was nowhere near what the Switch right. has. So it made it harder to kind of pick up the smaller details. Uh, I don't know what the holdup is. I have a feeling that that's all going to melt away at E3, and we'll finally get a look at it. And then lastly, of all the games that have been announced by Nintendo, Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Do you think we'll even see this game at E3, Matt? Yeah, I know they're saying still it's coming out this yeah, year. Yeah, I think we'll see it. If only to be a, so they can announce it's delayed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that might be it. Yeah. I you know they still swear 2017. I just I don't believe it. I I, I cannot yeah. believe that they show what they showed what we're seeing right now already. Like yeah. I really I mean, never like, thought that we would be able to even look at a new game in this series like, that if they quickly. Get, get this and Zelda out in the first year of the system. That's a crazy amount of like massive and Mario open world kind of yeah. It's 
I'd be pretty impressed if they get all that out in one in the first year. I mean, not I'll even be, the first year, the first nine months. Yeah, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest. Just seeing the work that's already been done in this trailer, I'm blown away by. It seems like they started working on this before they finished Xenoblade Chronicles for Wii U. Well, Monolith Soft is big enough to be working on two things at once. Yeah, at once. So it wouldn't surprise me if this has been in some form of development since the the first one came, was finished. Yeah, and. Chronicles X was sort of a, a another team's somewhat project, but I don't know a ton about how you know how that works, and nobody knows a ton about how any of Nintendo's first-party studios work internally. But um, it's certainly certainly more f further along than I would have expected. I'm not a huge fan of the character designs. I like, never why, have been a huge why, fan of their character designs. Yeah, but the first they, the, the, oh, I think they look the, ugly. The first one was, I mean, at least the first one everybody had full pants on. Like, I don't know what the <laughs> hell that is. They're gauchos. That's, that's some weird, like, Nomura <laughs> shit going on right Their there. Their character designs really are, I think, objectively terrible. It's rhyme time. Has anybody... I, I don't know. I think the, the designs in the first Xenoblade Chronicles were fine. I think Passable? Xenoblade Chronicles X got weird as hell. And then uh, this one, I'm, I just... I don't know what the hell I'm looking at on that main, that main kid. Like, it's just like, why... I really want something to guard the lower parts of my thighs, but I don't want the inner thigh to be, you know, covered up because that's where my power comes from. I don't, yeah. I don't know what, I don't know what's happening there. It's, it's that kind of, uh, what's the, one of the Final Fantasy Tactics Advance games, I think. It's like the classic weird character design. It's like this guy who, like, he's just got, his whole outfit is made of, like, built straps and a giant glass pizza cutter. And it's just like, wh what are you, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Like, I don't I think they just run out of ideas. There he is. <laughs> nice job, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that is, dude. No. Don't look at him. Just look clue. at the big thing in the background. That's the cool part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that maybe that was the idea. They're like, no one's going to pay attention to these dumb pants anyway. All right, that'll wrap up our Nintendo E3 preview. Stuff could break before next week's episode. If it does, we'll be sure to talk about it here on Game Face. That'll be episode 91. Uh, now it's time to go on to our trailer of the week, which is the week before E3. It's going to have to be a good trailer to make our trailer of the week. And I think we do have one. Um, this is the next game from Iron Galaxy, the team that's creating Killer Instinct. Um, Attack on Titan. What do you think about Attack on Titan? Uh, I like the first five episodes. Yeah. And then, uh, whoops, it just became a standard anime. <laughs> well, what if there was an Attack on Titan that wasn't anime at all? Tell me more. I saw this on Sifted. I mean, I mean. <laughs> you played along for a little while. So here it is. This game is called Extinction. Um, it, is, it bears more than a few resemblances to Attack on Titan, but I think it will appeal to people who maybe are not huge anime fans. Get those questions in. Let's roll it. Legends speak of an unstoppable army. Wave after wave of merciless evil. Destroying kingdoms. Crushing armies. Laying waste to humanity. Centuries ago, this war was fought by an ancient order. Now, the threat has returned, and only one remains. What do you think, Matt? 
Um, all right. I think it kind of loses something without the eeriness of the, the naked, weird, grinning people. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. You know, walking yeah, around. Yeah, I saw someone say in the chat that the orcs look too generic. I would probably agree with that. Also, like, the Koei Attack on Titan game was pretty good that came out last yeah. year. Um, I was surprised by how much I liked that. It, it captured it. Because, again... Half of Attack on Titan's appeal is is the weird monsters you're fighting, but it's also like the 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 3D maneuver gear kind of gives it kind of that Spider-Man sort of thing. And like, yeah. this looks a little more like like Assassin's Creed goes real wrong. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, I don't know how that guy fell from like you know he he, he landed from like skyscraper heights on cobblestones. That's gonna hurt your ankle at the very least. His league. sword absorbed all that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's get to some questions here. Uh, w. Matthew, one of our weekly viewers on our stream. How well do you think E3 will be received? Do you think we are being open to... Or do you think it being open to the public will help it? In what way? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It help, helped it make a little extra money. Um, I, I'm wondering if he's asking from the perspective of the people who are the public who are going for the first time, how they will perceive it. I don't know. I really don't know what someone going to E3 for the first time would think about it. You know, especially if you... Because my experience with E3 is colored by the fact that going there is like... I, I know everybody and I, I if I want to see anything, I, I pretty probably know someone I can ask and skip the line and do the kind of the usual thing. Whereas like if I went there just sort of, you know, like I did back in the like the late 90s and like, you know, went in cold and was like, okay, I'll just get in this line and hope I want a wave bird. Yeah. Um, like... I don't think the show is conducive to that as much these days. I don't think it's set up for it. No. I think that's going to be the problem. I think people who who maybe flew all the way across the country and, you know, you're plunking down yeah. a good chunk of cash. Like, I hope you also hotel, have tickets to flight, EA. Flight, tickets. Uh, you're talking about a couple grand, three grand there. I think those people might end up being a little disappointed. Yeah, like, I hope if you're doing that, you have, like, also have tickets to EA um, because I, it's it's not set up for like, you know, getting. Maybe, it's not like an amusement no. park where you have there's lines, but they don't move fast. It's like a lot of people are going to get in line to play Mario, and that's your day, and that's all they're going to play that day. Yep. And you hope that you end up in line next to someone who's cool and fun and brought their 3ds or their Switch with them, and you can sit there and play it because it will literally. Like, how big is that line going to be met? Think about how big the line for Zelda was last year, and we've shot it and showed it on this show a ton of times, just for the industry and the press. Mm -hmm. Now throw in another 16,000 people? Oh, yeah. I Even on the last day of the show last year, and usually these days, th Thursday is the was the dead day because once they started checking photo IDs for the badges, people couldn't just hand them off to the interns right. or whatever. And, you know, because a lot of times, like, the big wigs would go home Wednesday night and, and give them their badges kids off or to whatever wanted, yeah. to go, wanted to stick around and go. Yep. But after they, they stopped, put a stop to that, Thursday was real empty yep. by comparison. But even Thursday last year, they closed the, the line for Zelda, like, by 11 a.m. Yeah, I mean, like an was, hour and a half after it opened. Yeah, yeah, it was like, it was like no, that's it for the day. Like, it, it yeah. I mean, here's a pro tip for you guys. If any of you guys are going and you want to play Super Mario Odyssey, just when they open the gates, just run. To the, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. Just run to the Nintendo booth and get in line. We always used to shoot that. That's what we called it, the running of the nerds. Yep. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> used it many times, and it was like, and every time it's like, which hall do we shoot? The one with Nintendo's booth, yeah, like, because that's the thing everybody's got to get in line for. And it's not even just to play the game; it's like you'll get swag for the game. Get in, a lot like, of people just yeah. go and sell on eBay like that night or whatever. Last but... year they gave out the uh, the coin, yeah, that I think came with the collector's edition, yeah, later on. But like that, that was you got that if you played the game. If you want to play Mario, that's what you're gonna have to do to play it, unless Pretty you much. unless you really want to sit in line all day and that'll burn up one of your three days yeah. so as it is you're already going to be waiting in line for a couple hours probably i mean it appears, unless you're there like 6 a.m yeah it appears that the keely's e3 coliseum is trying to act as this kind of overflow room for e3 mm. um because they are adding sixteen thousand people into a scenario that's already chaotic and insane mm -hmm. and i feel like they're creating sort of this comic-con type lecture hall thing for people to go who maybe just want to sit in a real chair and have something to look at while they do it. Um, what I've, and no disrespect to Keeley, but what I've seen of the schedule of that so far hasn't been 
exactly compelling. Like James Gunn is like the keynote speaker, which I love. We talked about James on the show. I know him personally, worked with him. Great guy. He's tangentially worked in video games. Mm. I don't know how that fits into like e- how he fits into E3 necessarily. I don't know. But I, it, at the very least, it's going to be a place where people can go and sit down on a chair because that's yeah. something you can't do at E3. It's like there's no place to go and relax. Like even when you get food, it's like you end up sitting on the marble floor up against a pillar while you eat. Like so, I, you know, opening up that new thing with Keely, and I'm sure there will be some panels that'll be great. You know, he knows everybody; he's really well connected, and he knows what he's he's doing. So. There should be some great panels in there. I think that will help with some of the overflow. But it's going to be madness. It, it really is going to be madness. Um, it'll be interesting to see it happen for the first time and see how E3 adjusts to it next year if they let more people in, less people in. Uh, if they try to create more things for people to do so it isn't so mobbed in the main halls. Um, but I think to your point, I think Thursday will be happening now. I think mm-hmm. that they're because the public is let in, and you're right, the industry is over it by Thursday. Everybody, good. Everyone gets most of their work done Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then everybody goes out on Wednesday night and gets drunk. Uh-huh. And then <clears throat> Thursday, I think last year I was like the only industry person there on Thursday. I was walking around, I'm like, I'm the only person who's not hung over in this whole city right now. Um, and it was barren, like empty. But it was great for me. I could go uh-huh. and just hit everything I wanted to and play everything for our awards and everything. So... I think this year you're not going to get that lull. I think on Thursday, no, think so. it's just going to be rocking just like it was every other day, which is good. It's good for the, well, it's the what show. what they want. I think this is partly a, an attempt at a solution It to needs it. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Thursday last year was embarrassing. Like, if you brought some kind of a big wig there, and that used to happen with me at Viacom. Like, we'd do our work, and then on Thursday was the day that I took, like, all the SVPs from New York through E3. And it was a pain because I had to, like, get everything lined up with all the booths because they don't want to wait in line. Mm -hmm. Like, they're like, no. And my boss was like, they're not waiting in line. You make sure that they have VIP access to everything. Like, I don't want to walk up and have them just standing around in a booth. And I was like, all right. So I had to set everything up and have to take them on this tour. And it was embarrassing sometimes because you try to have these executives from New York in and you want to convince them to invest more money into GT. And you're trying to tell them how great the industry is and how lively and vibrant it is. And then they show up, and it's like a ghost town at E3. And it's not, it's not a good look for the industry in general. So I, I think Pac, I don't know if he said it on camera or off camera, but he's throwing around an idea where you do E3 for the industry Tuesday and Wednesday, and then give it up to the public on Thursday and Friday. And I think, mm-hmm. honestly, that is the best idea. Um, a little bit, I mean, there's been other shows that have done that. Uh, I think... Uh, did TGS ever do that? Yeah, TGS does that. Yeah, TGS has a press day, and then the, and the, and then the rest day is two and three are public. everyone. Right. Um, and I think E3 could learn a little something about about how to manage like the public versus the industry crowds mm-hmm. with the way that's been handled. Um, it's just, you know, they've never quite accepted the idea that E3, because you know, E3 began as like a, a, an advertising, marketing, retail conference. Yeah. It, was, it, was it was an expo. It was a, it was a conference. It was like it's like going to the dental conference to see all the new dental equipment and decide what you're going to buy for your office. Like that's what that is, and it kind of has developed. Like, <coughs> TGS was always a show. It was yeah. always a thing that people were expected to attend, who were interested in enthusiasts, not just industry. And you know, E3 has never quite accepted its role as a public show until really this year. Yep. Um, even though there have been years where like you know you could get in no matter who you were if you're willing to pay the fee. Right. Um, and the fee was high. Oh, 300, 400 bucks. Yeah. Um, but not, if you're a rich kid, yeah, no your problem. daddy will pay it to just get, get you out of his hair for the day. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, I knew people who like, you know, worked standard retail jobs and they'd save for three months. To do oh, it. I had a friend who... Some people do that with like, conventions and stuff because you still got to travel to these things. Yeah, but for I, some I people, a, it's E3. Yeah, I had a, a lifelong friend from central Pennsylvania come out here with her son one year. And uh, he just walked up and just paid the money. Mm-hmm. And I kind of walked him around a little bit and showed him the ropes. And I was like, "Have fun!" But yeah, he he paid it, and his his parents would do pretty well. So I remember when you could do that with the Comic Con. Yeah, not anymore. When I'm mean, like 2005, 2006, I think I just walked up, handed him my G4 business card, and they gave me a badge on site. I just showed up. Yep. No way. Did not, not anymore. You wouldn't even get in the door. Yeah. Uh, next one from Vic 7 What are the chances Xbox Scorpio is able to get high-end settings for games already released patch in order to take advantage of a significant power bump? I think they've said that it will. 
more or less. Like that. that uh, I mean, I don't know, dude. We're still seeing like patches coming in late for PlayStation 4 Pro. Like they just mm-hmm. released a patch for a PS4 Pro for Prey yesterday. Yeah, but they've already said that. Um, they did say that, like 360 backwards metal 360 games will run better on the yeah, Scorpio. They that, did. That, that will be dependent on power. Yeah, it seems like it has kind of. Uh, there's a there's a scaling built scaling into its architecture to it. Yeah. yeah. So it should be better than Pro, I think. Yeah. I mean, also remember, I mean, one of Microsoft's strengths is OS. So if anyone can figure out how that works, it would be them. Will they put the effort in to do that? I guess we'll see. Uh, OTAPs. Do you and Matt ever hook up and play games together online? Very rarely. Not really, yeah. I see you online all the time. We're rarely uh, playing the same thing, I think, is part of it. We were playing uh, Star Trek at the same time last night, mm-hmm. but I, as I was closing out my last game, you jumped on, and I was like, I need to go to bed. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think the problem is, is that we, there's just, we haven't been playing a lot of multiplayer games. We've been playing a lot of single-player stuff over mm-hmm. all, for, the, for a long time, actually. You can't play Persona 5 together. No. <laughs> we definitely would have played together if you could. Um, and then Matt, you just don't play a lot of like shooters online, no. which is where I spend a lot of my time playing online. So the stars just haven't aligned. Um, here's from Snowpiercer. How likely is it that Nintendo will announce a, a port apocalypse of Wii U titles for the Switch this E3? Hmm. What's left? Um... Actually, I want to get that right. A port calypse. I think it's highly likely. There's probably be a few more. Yeah. Define Calypse. Is that three games or is that like ten games? Because I think we'll get like a few Wii U games coming. I mean, there are already rumors going on about a pocket tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one that's already floating out there. That would make sense. Um, I mean, Smash Brothers. People have been expecting that for a port of Smash Brothers Wii U. For I a think long we're going to see a new Smash Brothers shown off at the mm-hmm. show. I, if we do, I think it's going to be built on the assets from the Wii U one. Though. I'm sure. I mean, um, it's pretty obvious at this point the Switch is really no more powerful than the Wii U. Mm-hmm. Just a smidge. Like, it'd be nice to see some of the Platinum stuff ported over. Like, but it sold so poorly that I don't Bayonetta know. Bayonetta 2 would be nice. Bayonetta 2 or Wonderful 101 would be nice to see, but, like, they weren't maybe weren't successful enough to warrant it. I don't know. Um, maybe maybe it'll be a port of Vanquish. As long as they're, as long as Sega's Might as well, while they're at it. Putting that on stuff, why not? Uh, Cheater Hater, what is the schedule for Sifted Content next week? Game Face Friday. Game Face will be Friday. Wait, Sam, are you good for Friday next week? At 3. Yeah, so it'll be a little later next week. We won't be doing it at 1 o'clock. We'll be doing it a little later in the afternoon next Friday. And that will be our final pre-E3 blowout. We'll go over all the rest of the publishers. We'll deliver our predictions for E3. Um, and then we're still figuring out the schedule. We will be doing, like, the sifted hangouts for the press conferences, though, for the big ones. What are the press... Uh, the press conferences start on Saturday or Sunday? They do, like, EA Saturday, Bethesda, and Microsoft Sunday, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then Monday, and then Sony... Sony. Is Sunday, Sunday's Monday night? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, Monday night. And then I'm not sure exactly what time Nintendo releases its direct. Traditionally, it's been Tuesday mornings, right. but who knows... We will be doing a live hangout for, definitely for the Microsoft and Sony and probably Nintendo press conferences. Mm -hmm. Will we do one on Saturday for EA? Probably not. Uh, It's probably not worth coming all the way in here just to do a hangout. Just EA, there's no Bethesda. Yeah, it's just EA on Saturday. And then probably what we'll do in the pre-show on Sunday is we'll wrap up what happened with EA the day prior. So mm-hmm. count on hanging out with us for most of the press conferences. Uh, and no matter what, you'll be getting analysis of all of them from, from us. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, let's see. Score fear. What don't you want to see at E3? <laughs> A couple of people I don't want to see. Happy to, <laughs> happy to be able to watch Game Face Live again. Yeah, Scorfer, I haven't seen you in our chat for a while, actually. Welcome back. What don't you want to see at E3? I don't want to see that Rabbids game. <laughs> mm. um, I don't want to see another damn trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3 that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I don't want to see another Halo game for Scorpio. Mm. Because I know that's what we're going to get, probably. Well, it sounds like we won't. Really? 
That's what I, I heard. There's no the, Halo Six will not be there, but Bungie will show something, which I have to believe is a Halo Three Anniversary Edition. No, because this is ten years this year. I don't want to see any more games from the following franchises: Forza, you're Gears gonna be, of you're War. You're gonna be disappointed. Forza, I know I am. Gears of War, Halo. I actually would take maybe a Fable at this point. Yeah, I'd take a Fable. We're going to see Crackdown, obviously, finally, maybe. Man, you're not into the Microsoft press I'm really not. Yeah. I mean, it's because, I mean, look, Microsoft has been milking this same handful of franchises for, like, a decade or more. Yep. Like, show us some new stuff and not, like, some crappy little indie project, side project. Invest some money in some new IP. In good IP with a big budget that we actually want to play. Mm. It's like you look back to like when they first showed off Xbox One and all those games that they announced as new IP. They a lot of them ended up just being like indie, like disposable, whatever. Like if they even came out, yeah, at all. I'll, I'll say I'm not looking forward to sitting through whatever they want to show me about Sea of Thieves. No, I am. Like I've always found the presentation the presentation of that game to be fairly dull, even though it is fun to play it. Yeah. Um, I just don't want to stare at it for ten minutes. They are going to get time. They are going to spend time on it. Cause I'm sure. Hopefully, it's coming out this year better be yeah i I figure that's probably one of your launch titles for the scorpio it should be and it's also on pc so it should be easy to port right over to scorpio uh box 91 what do you think the prevailing sentiment may be coming out of e3 um that the scorpio costs too much and Scorpio costs too much. That's what I, just remember. I, I, I don't know what, what people will think about. I think Nintendo is bulletproof in the sense the fans are going to think it was amazing and people who aren't Nintendo fans are going to be like, eh. Yeah, um, that's kind of what happens every year. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, look, I'll be, I'll be more positive on Nintendo if, if they absolutely like swear, pinky swear up and down Xenoblade is making it this year. But it, like I said, I won't believe it until I have the game in my hand. Uh, but I think the main takeaway is going to end up being the Scorpio costs too much. I think the main takeaway is going to be that the, Scorp- the next gen is here. That Scorpio is the first next-gen console. Mm. Um, And I think Microsoft will name it in such a way that it appears that it is the next console and not just a continuation of Xbox One while being very, very particular about pointing out that Mm. it is a thousand percent backwards compatible with Xbox One. The Xbox Um, window. I think all the disappointment that everyone has had with PlayStation 4 Pro is just going to be washed away with Scorpio. I think it's going to blow some people's minds. And I agree with Matt. I think, even though Pactor is saying no, he's saying like his prediction was 399 Scorpio. Um, I don't agree with that. I think it's going to be more than that. I mean, I think he's right in that it can't be more than that if they want it to be a big hit. Yeah. But I think it is going to be more than that. I agree. And I think that will be... I think the story is going to be... It's more expensive, but I can see why mm-hmm. it's more expensive. So I think it's going to be a conundrum everyone's going to have to wrestle with um, as they figure out whether they want to buy it or not. Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I think Scorpio is probably going to be the big story coming out of E3. I can pretty much tell you already Mario is probably going to win Game of the Show for most publications because it's a Nintendo game. Yep. Um, but I think as far as like hardware and the bigger stories, I think it's going to be Scorpio because I think it's going to blow some people's minds when they get to see some of the games for it. Um, Kills with Kindness. Is Resident Evil 7 or Star Trek Bridge Crew a better VR experience? I don't know. I haven't played Resident Evil 7. Oh, well, I've played both. Um, that's really apples and oranges. Uh, man. That's a really good question. Because they both succeed. <laughs> they exceed at the opposites. Resident Evil succeeds at isolating you in this absolutely terrifying environment. And... Star Trek Bridge Crew succeeds at bringing you together with other people in this very welcoming environment. So I think it probably depends on what kind of player you are, honestly. Uh, Because if you look at them from that perspective, they're kind of on equal footing. As far as which game had a bigger impact on me personally, definitely Resident Evil 7. At least the first six hours of it before it kind of turns into a more traditional action game towards the end. Uh, The first handful of hours of Resident Evil 7 are they will affect you big time. And so I would say if I had to tell someone to buy one or the other and they're cool with violent games, I would say go Resident Evil 7. Also, you're going to play it a lot longer than you will play uh, Star Trek, at least until the DLC starts rolling in anyway. Johnny Hurricane says, did you see this Shadow of War got pushed to October 10th? Think this is around the time of the Scorpio launch. 
Hmm. Maybe. I feel like Scorpio is <laughs> going to launch closer to November. Very but, perceptive. Um, but that is an interesting, you know. Right. It's a very short jump. Uh huh. Is a uh, Shadow of War coming out for PC as well? Oh yeah. That does kind of make some sense. Who's who? Uh, who made that comment? That was Johnny Hurricane. Johnny, you're on it, bruh. I'd say that's a very astute observation. Maybe that's sort of one of the marquee games that Microsoft is going to tout with it, but you would think it would have already locked up some kind of an exclusive marketing deal for the game beforehand. Mm. You never know. Because showing off a game like that on Scorpio actually is kind of promoting the PlayStation a little bit as well. Yeah, they do have a tie in there. But if you can push it as like, you know, looks better here. It's I been mean, too long since we've seen those commercials where here's the game on this <laughs> console and here's the game on our console. Yeah, they that, may come back again. Yeah, they might. Well, I, should, I think they should and bring so back... And so scrambles to try to... You remember the old, old commercials? We were barely old enough to remember them. They were for, uh, uh, I think it was uh, in television, and it was George Plimpton. Oh, absolutely, I remember like, those, like yeah. Just standing there in a, in, a, in a tweed suit talking about how... Clearly, the difference is, is well, noticeable. Like, like, here's Space Invaders on Atari 2600. Yeah, here's here's Astro Invaders Smash on, on television. television. The difference is clear. Yeah, and, it yeah. was like, <laughs> and it was just like, erudite man tells you the graphics are better on this system. You crazy <laughs> man. Like, yeah. like, you fool. Buy the one that doesn't look like this. You and know, I've like, said it before. I wish that like these companies weren't so buddy-buddy like they are today. Yeah. They're all like congratulating each other. Great lunch, man. It's like, yeah. no, you need, to take, you need to eat that guy's lunch. You need, to, you need to bring in Nicolas Cage <laughs> and have him just, like, pee on the other <laughs> console. Like, just whatever it takes. Uh, more, more, uh, more of the old, old console war advertising where Crash Bandicoot screaming at Nintendo headquarters on the megaphone. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll answer one more. Fly, play thing. Fly. Scorpio is saying there's an arms test punch an hour from now? Yeah, 5 p.m. I think is. Oh, uh, I didn't see the that. First thought... one, first one of the weekend is 5 p.m. Was it was last time too, but I just wasn't. I will not make it, it, unfortunately. Uh, Axel F. 1986, uh, Beverly Hills Cop fan. Will will we see Media Molecules Dreams at E3 this year? I believe we will. We will. Pretty extensively. Well, yeah, I think, I think we it, we will. Yeah, it's not canceled. No. I saw people talking no. on a podcast yesterday thinking it was canceled. No, and it's like, not at all canceled. I think it was uh, IGN's PlayStation video cast. They said it, they were thinking it might be canceled. Well, IGN should know better they, because it's not. Yeah, it's definitely not. It's still coming. Um, OTT Apps asks, how is Marcus doing? Uh, Marcus seems to be doing pretty good. He's doing really good. He's back into games, which is great. Although he's been on this like VR kick, yeah, like he got PlayStation VR, Trek. and now he's just been playing like tons of VR games, which I never guess I'd ever see Marcus getting into. Yeah, he was super dismissive of it uh, last year. One and two, he's just one of those guys that doesn't like to fiddle with anything. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, I don't want to have to put this on and get the, like get my headset. Like he's just not like that. Yeah, I can't smoke while I got it on. Yeah, then... exactly. <laughs> I think he may have finally quit yeah, I think that. He quit that. I think those days are finally over. VR is his new anti-drug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, he seems to be doing okay, and we should we should all see him here in the next week uh, extensively throughout the show. He's very uh, much back to himself. He is, yeah, and he did get into the show. He's got like his own badge and everything, so he'll be around. Uh, we'll probably have some stories to tell about Marcus whenever we get back. So, all right, that's it. We're gonna wrap it up right there, people. Uh, thanks everyone who stuck around for the entire episode. Hope you guys are all getting hyped for E3. I know I am definitely getting jacked up. How you feel, Matt? You pumped? Yeah, I got some stuff I got to do between then and now, so I can't. We all do. I can't look forward that far. That's the E3 thing. It's like you know, in the back of your mind, this awesomeness is coming, but you have all this business to handle on the front first. But uh, we'll do that, and we'll be ready for you guys for E3 sifters. Hope you guys are ready. Uh, everyone have a great weekend, a safe weekend. Go Penguins! Game face is up and out. <laughs>